Okay, uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is July 29th, 2021. It's 930 and I am going to call this meeting of the board to order. I have a few administrative details. Um, our executive director, Bryn Hare, has officially extended an offer to our finalists for our ASM3 position, and she has accepted, um, which is fantastic news. I'm going to give her a little bit of time to make her own notifications before I announce her name, but I can tell you that she brings a very extensive background in managing a regulatory body and is just such a positive and helpful person um, and brings a real degree of professionalism to the board. So we're lucky she'll be joining us. Um, our general counsel position and our administrative service coordinator, two positions have closed and Bryn is in the process of reviewing and interviewing those candidates. Um, so really with these hires coming together and our advisory committee having been named and our consultants being onboarded, um, our core team is really starting to take shape. Um, and that actually coincides nicely with kind of where we are as a board. Today is our actual final single issue kind of thematic meeting. Um, and it really marks the end of this initial sort of fact finding stage that we're in. Um, we may have one more meeting um, to kind of get to some witnesses that we haven't heard from that weren't we weren't able to schedule earlier and we might take a week off. Um, but uh, for the most part, we are going to shift our work um, and really lean on our consultants to help guide us and our advisory committee through every aspect of the regulatory framework and start to develop um, some of those recommendations that we need to make in October and November. Um, before we get to our agenda, um, has anyone, everyone had an opportunity to review the draft minutes from uh, 722? Yes. Yes. Um, I take a motion to approve the minutes. Move to approve the minutes from July 22nd. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, aye. So turning to the agenda, today we are focusing on public safety issues, including highway safety and safe banking. Um, our first witness today is Mandy White, who's the Highway Safety Data Analyst for the uh, VTrans Vermont Agency of Transportation. Specifically, she manages crash data for the state. And I thought it would be a very helpful framing for our conversation today to hear about that data and any trends that we might be experiencing in Vermont. Um, Mandy, I hope I'm not getting you in trouble by mentioning, but you you were gracious enough to come to join us while you are double booked. And um, it just you know speaks to the level of importance of the data that we're gonna hear in this issue. So um, if you're with us um, and you'd like to turn your video on or unmute yourself, Please feel free. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. All right. So I I did a little presentation. I didn't know. I just started it, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to share it or not. So you should be able to. You're a presenter. Okay. Let's do it this way. <clears throat> Can everybody see the slides? I don't have it in in the uh, slideshow mode, but yeah, yeah, we can see it. That's that's great. It's a pretty simple slideshow. I just wanted to go through a few things, and this was the easiest way for me to uh, to explain things. Um, thank you, James, for inviting me to speak to this um, this morning. So you had asked me to talk a little bit about where crash data comes from. We collect the crash data from law enforcement reports. So every time there is a motor vehicle crash on a public highway, we collect that data in a web-based crash report system called Web Crash. Um, within that system, we have an ad hoc reporting tool where we can then query the data. So anything, any piece of data that law enforcement collects on our roadways um, is queryable, which includes drug and alcohol information. Um, the next thing, so we want. I I wanted to talk a little bit about recent data. So currently, we have 31 fatal crashes in Vermont, uh, with 34 fatalities. Last year in 2020, we had 58 
fatal crashes with 61 fatalities. Um, the reason I wanted to point out the, the difference in, um, so this little chart here shows where we're at compared to previous years. So um, we're currently at 31. Last year, we were at 30 at this time of year. Uh, the last time we were this high um, isn't even on the chart, to be honest. Um, so 2018 was our worst year prior to this. So uh, in 2020, the difference is, is that we had the pandemic. We had a stay at home order um, during that time. The traffic on our roadways was reduced significantly. Uh, we still saw a, a huge increase in fatalities over that year. Um, so I added some BMTs. So that's vehicle miles traveled. It's an annual number. So the annual number for 2020 was 5.9 billion cars. Um, in 2019, to compare that to a normal, what we would call a more normal year, is 7.3 billion cars on our on our road. So we had an 18% decrease. Um, there was, I think there was a, a news report a, a, not too long ago that said that the, the traffic on our roadways was like comparable to like World War II or something. So it was, it's very much, it was a huge decrease on our roadways. Um, so during the stay at home order in the early parts of it, we were seeing the, the dips as low as like 50 to 40% of our traffic, normal traffic, but the overall decrease over the whole year was 18%. Um, and currently, right now, we're seeing still on our roads about a 14% uh, lower number than we had in this at this time in 2019. So if that gives you a little bit of a, a background on, you know, our, we have less cars on our roads, but we're still seeing an increase in fatalities and fatal crashes. Um, so I send out a on, a, on a weekly basis, I send out this little chart here that kind of shows fatal crashes as compared to previous years. Um, I just wanted to call this out uh, because James had asked me to talk about some poly substance and where we're at, um, where what, we, what it looks like in the past year. So in 2016, we, we saw, we had this year where we had more um, alcohol than drug so, well, let me talk about these. Alcohol operators suspected as driving under the influence of alcohol only. Then there's the operator suspected as driving under in, the influence of drugs only. And then there's the, the dual alcohol and drug in here. And then I call out cannabis in here um, because I've been asked to. Um, so the numbers, as you can see, we we kind of fluctuate between alcohol and drug. Um, 2020 was the first year where alcohol was a lot higher than it had been in several years, uh, but drug drug only crash uh, operators with only drugs in their system have kind of stayed pretty consistent in in the 15 to 20 range. Um, or I should say 14 to 20 range. Uh, the dual the dual drug and alcohol that kind of that seems to have come down a little bit. Um, over the last couple of years, but as you can see, um, marrow or cannabis involved in crashes has kind of been consistent in that teens in the teens there. I don't know if you if you want me to do questions at the end. I didn't even think to ask this. I tend to, as I do I, these things, ask. Yeah, just because you're short on time, why don't you why, why don't we save questions for the end, um, just so that we, we can make sure we get through your slides. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so this one I wanted to show, it's a similar chart. Um, what we're looking at is alcohol only, but this also calls out alcohol and Delta 9 THC or cannabis. Um, you can see that in this line here over the years, alcohol and other drugs, which does include Delta 9. So there's another poly substance line here. Um, and then the Delta 9 alone and then drugs other. And if anybody can't see this, I can always provide this to you, James, and then we can you can share it Thanks. as needed. Um, so the, the main point here is to look at this um, impaired percentage of fatal crashes. So we're seeing at least 50% most years since 2016, at least 50% of our fatal crashes have an impaired driver involved. 
no crashes. Um, from 2019 to 2020, that increased about 4%. Um, and then I, I also have this little, this other chart here or graph that shows um, just the marijuana, like the different percentages of, of marijuana, either alone with alcohol, with other drugs, or with other drugs and alcohol. So just a, another, it's kind of just slicing and dicing the data a little bit differently for everybody so you can see um, what you're looking for if you're looking for something specific. Uh, and this this last chart I did, um, it's actually, I kind of copied something I think Colorado did several several years ago. I saw on a report and I was like, well, I wonder what Vermont's would look like. And so I put, put our data into a chart and it shows uh, crashes where a driver tested positive for marijuana. Um, I added in the date of decriminalization and then the date of legalization and where where we are at on that chart. The purple line is total crashes and then the blue line is major crashes. And a major crash is any crash where at least one person has died or one person has been um, seriously injured. Okay. And then the one other thing uh, James had asked me to speak to is countermeasures and strategies. Um, I, I put a little, I slide in here. Um, basically, these are all countermeasures and strategies for highway safety that I'm aware of. And I'll put that qualifier in there. Our, uh, we, we put them into our strategic highway safety plan, which is a five-year plan that states our goals and outlines tactics for minimizing um, the occurrence and severity of crashes. And those are specific, those are all we generally look at major crashes as defined a few minutes ago. Um, and then the other plan is the highway safety plan. That's an annual plan that's done by the high, state highway safety office that is data driven. They use all of the data coming right out of, of my program, the crash program. Um, and then they establish performance targets and select countermeasure strategies for for highway safety activities. Um, that's a pretty quick, I think, um, I think that's answers, or at least that hits on a lot of the things that you had sent me in an email. So I wanted to make sure that um, I hit those points for you. And that's, that's all Thank my slides, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for putting that together and especially kind of the, <clears throat> that last chart, which kind of tracks the loosening of our cannabis policies and, and how that um, how that has impacted or may may have impacted or correlated at least with some of the fatal crashes or major crashes. Um, and other questions from Andy? Um, I have a question about this chart actually. So it, it legalization in in 2018 and then an immediate dip and then an immediate rise. Do you have any sense of what what the cause what what would have impacted that? I don't, and I, I know you might be speaking with other highway safety people um, today, and, and I'm happy to, to send this to you and have you ask them too, but I don't, I think 2019, I will say 2019, I didn't put it in my, in my data set, but our 2019, we had an unusually low number of fatal crashes, and that could have also, we we did have, um, I think we had 44 fatalities that year, which is a very, our, our average generally for fatal crashes and fatalities is around 60 to 65. So 44 was our second lowest year in like 40 years or something. I can't remember um, exactly how many, but it was uh, an unusually low number. So it's possible that that, it kind of dipped with the whole, with the overall crash data. Was 2019 the year that the sort of like speed monitoring was set up on the interstate? And I suppose that's a question to anyone who sort of remembers that timeline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. I'll do a little research there. Okay. I don't know if I necessarily have a, a question more so than an observation, I guess. You, you, were, you said that in 2020, there is the fewest amount of cars on Vermont highways since World War II, yet it's the highest on this graph, there's the highest number of um, total crashes involving somebody who tested positive for marijuana. So more of an observation than anything else, but hopefully I'm understanding that right. 
Yeah, we definitely, it's, it's uh, our fatality rate, which, which is a number we compare our fatalities to our vehicle miles traveled, our fatality rate, like skyrocket. I mean, it jumped extremely high and, you know, we're, we're under the gun now to, to not meet uh, some federal performance <laughs> measures because of it, but we can't control the traffic, unfortunately. And or a pandemic, which happens once every hundred years or so. So, uh, Mandy, I've got a, a couple of related questions or similarly related questions. Um, if I recall correctly, the kind of operator blood testing is done for all fatal crashes. Um, is that right? That's mandated by law, I think. It's it's not. I I don't. I hate to say that I, I, mean, I actually don't know the law necessarily, but I can tell you that not all operators are tested. Um, a lot of, I, that I'm aware of, I do get some that come through that were not tested. And I think a lot of times that tends to be, um, well, they're not tested if they're alive and there's no warrant. I know yeah. that. Um, Deceased operators, I believe, are um, yeah. always tested. And then the ones that the one the anomalies that we get are those operators that are taken out of state. Um, I don't always get drug or alcohol test results from from other states for those. Um, I can request them. I get them pretty. I do a pretty good job of getting things from New Hampshire, New York. I is. I hate to say this. I, this is anyway as. I, I can't get data from them. <laughs> it's really difficult. So, um, yeah, and we don't tend to have a lot that go to Massachusetts, but New York and New Hampshire are two big ones. And New Hampshire, I usually can get the data through the other FARS analysts in pretty quick timing when I ask for it. Um, can you there talk, could be rules. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what that term suspected impairment means? Sure. Uh, how, uh, okay. how you make that determination or how law enforcement makes that determination. So in, you mean in this one where I say suspected? Yeah, exactly. Um, the reason that that stayed as that says suspected, I will, it's more, it's more for the current year. So the current year it's suspected, the other years it's been confirmed, but because of the chart, it, I just leave it as suspected, but it's always suspected until we get toxicology results. So until then, um, a lot of times I, I get um, I get fatal notifications from law enforcement every time there's a fatal crash, or at least from uh, state police is very good at, at sending those immediately. Um, the local, the municipalities, I have to ask for it, but I usually get them. Um, They'll they'll mark there's a there's a field on there that's marked whether or not they suspect alcohol. Um, a lot of times they put unknown, so a lot of times I don't know, and that's where there's a lot of holes in that for that current year data, like that four two four. Those are things that have either been marked or I've already got toxicology for. Um, all those other crashes are still marked as unknown for me. Uh, we have quite a few. So June was, we had eight or nine fatalities and I don't have any data for that yet. So we, we definitely have a lot of, a lot of data we're still waiting on for that, for that year. So um, to me as a, you know, member of the cannabis board, it's really important <clears throat> to see what the impact of adult use is going to be on these numbers. Um, are there any other kind of baseline data points that we wish that we are collecting now or, or should collect now that will help us inform um, how, you know, the opening of retail and legal sales of cannabis will impact our highway safety? I don't, are you asking me or everybody? <laughs> yeah, that I, was a question for you as just kind yeah. of a, you know, a person who's most familiar with the data set that you, you receive. Yeah. Um, are there things that could be improved upon or um, data points that are not being collected that should be um, that you think might improve our kind of overall picture of, of either current impaired driving or how it might and how it might change in the future? I would 
for for the data side of things, I would love to see. Um, I think I think we chatted a little bit, but I feel like so I can get really great data on fatal crashes, but all those other crashes out there, um, I think it's very underreported. So finding a way to collect drug and alcohol use, uh, drug specifically, because drug is harder, right? It's you know you need to do a test, and there needs to be uh, it needs to go through the toxicologist. Um, but some way of getting more data and and connecting it to the crash report would make the the overall crash data. Um, this report that I show you here, like major crashes are pretty well reported, but I think overall, like there's there's fatal crashes I get toxicology for all the time that I reach out to law enforcement and say, please update your crash report because when I pull the data for things like the cannabis board or or whoever that's asking for it, I feel like the only data that I can give them is is fatal because I I'm I'm monitoring it because I'm getting toxicology from the ME's office. I don't have to wait for law enforcement to uh, to provide that for me. And sometimes I'm having them correct correct crash reports with it. So definitely getting law enforcement to to report this a lot more, or at least even if they and I don't even know how to how to have them report it, but more, but definitely, I don't know. There's, there's definitely, there's some training for law enforcement out there, like a ride and maybe putting more DREs on the, on the list. That would be great. When you get more data. Yeah. I mean, it is one of the things you're, you're kind of um, getting at is, and if, if law enforcement's not, I don't know how they report data to you. Do they kind of look at it from a, a major contributing factor perspective? I know you're reading toxicology reports. I'm not saying anybody should drive drive in, impaired or under the influence of marijuana, but but you know, looking at the data, is there any breakouts for you know weather being a major contrib contributing factor, other drivers on the road being a major contributing factor, alcohol impairment, drug impairment, um, so on and so forth. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it gets that granular as opposed to just this was in somebody's system. I don't know what that definition of maybe I'm making up this term that isn't even used in this context, but a major contributing factor and understanding why a crash occurred. Yep. So we, um, the crash report form collects contributing factors. Um, they have a, an option for two for each for each operator. So the operator has a primary and a secondary. Um, a lot of times they have that they do have the ability to collect it in there so um, even without drug test results so that's definitely something to try to remind them that if that is a, a factor to, to fill it in what we can't do if they only utilize that and don't give us the, any other result information is know whether it's alcohol or drugs and what drug it is but we right. can get that granular in the report but if there's no test, that information is not available. And yes, we can get more granular into weather factors, um, vehicle factors. We have defective equipment field on here. Um, I'm trying to think without looking at the crash report form. Um, there's a parent operator condition. So there's also whether or not they're fatigued or um, impaired in other ways. We, you know, we are, that's where we get into the some of the uh, critical critical emphasis areas in the strategic highway safety plan as we look at impaired driving versus infrastructure issues so roadway mm -hmm. issues as well do those toxicology reports tell you the level of cannabis in someone's system they do okay and is it like a last 30 days last seven days last hour uh, can you get that type of reporting that is not, i don't yeah i don't believe that's on the report it's usually when yeah usually the toxicology is only for the deceased so it would would have been and i don't know enough about it so to speak to it myself about at what point when they die how long that still lasts in their system or anything so um I think our next witness might know. He's he's law enforcement, and he um, cool. I think can speak between the active and inactive metabolites that are, that are tested okay. for. Yep. Yep. 
Okay. Mandy, are there, um, is there anything specific uh, in the strategic highway safety plan um, around per preparing for legalization for, for t adult use recreational? Not currently. Um, we are, we're in our last year of the current five-year plan and we are actually, um, that's the workshop I w I'm in this morning is we're working on rewriting that new, that plan for the next five years. Um, so we're, we've, we've got a few uh, working groups that we're putting, that we've put together and I'm in the, the data one. Surprising. <laughs> we we've been assigned um, Major Ingrid Jonas, former Major Ingrid Jonas, to to our advisory panel, and I'd love to connect her uh, on that issue uh, to you all for for that piece of it. Um, if she's willing to if she's willing to to do that, and you're willing to have her as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So. I think that's it. I think that's, I mean, that's all the, I think this is an important framing for us, especially some of the recent trends. Um, and I think it kind of gives us something to think about and keep our eye on. And um, yeah, thank, thank you for joining us. I don't want to take up any more of your time because I know that you got to jump back to another meeting. Um, so, but thank you for, for being with us today and sharing this and, and for the slides. Do you mind if, if we put them up on our website? Is that okay? No, do you want me to? I probably should clean them up and put our. I'll probably get in trouble if I don't put my B Trans logo on it or something somewhere. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, whenever they're ready, whenever you feel like they're ready, um, just if you could send them over and, and I'll make sure that we get them up there. Because um, I think this is really important kind of baseline data for us to consider. Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Um, so our next witness today, um, if uh, you're with us, is Jay Reagan. Hey, Jay. Hi, can you uh, folks hear me and see me okay? Yeah, we can. So, so Jay um, is a sergeant um, with the Vermont State Police. He's also the subject matter expert on impaired driving for the Department of Public Safety. Um, you know, I audited the DRE class and you literally taught the module on cannabis impairment. Um, and so I thought it'd be really important for us to hear about how the state police and others are preparing for, um, you know, this eventual market. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit about the DRE program, how that works, how that operates, how that's filling the void of kind of, um, the lack of kind of impairment standards for cannabis and uh, a roadside test. Um, and honestly, I'd love to hear just about kind of some of the physiological responses to cannabis consumption, because I hear more often than not that driving while after consuming cannabis is not bad. It's, sa it's safe, certainly safer than alcohol. Um, and I think that there's also a lot of folks out there that might be coming to Vermont um, in once we have adult use sales that will be kind of low information cannabis consumers and how, um, you know, consumption of cannabis alongside other impairing substances might have, you know, synergistic effects or, or kind of some of the stuff that, you know, I've learned about through my work as a prosecutor and, and my work uh, in, the DRE. in the DRE program. It's a lot to cover, but if you, I'll, I'll leave it to you, your capable hands. <laughs> Nothing like expectations there, Mr. Pepper, thanks. <laughs> um, so I'll take just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just 30 seconds uh, to run through uh, some of my qualifications in the subject matter. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, been a state trooper since 2006. I worked the road up at the St. Albans Barracks for about 13 of those years. Last two years after my promotion to sergeant, I've uh, been the uh, subject matter expert for impaired driving for DPS, the Department of Public Safety. Um, in addition to being a drug recognition expert, and I'll talk about that training in a moment, <clears throat> but in addition to being a drug recognition expert, uh, which I've been since 2008, uh, I'm also a drug recognition expert instructor, so I teach the subject matter. 
Uh, I'm a court qualified expert uh, in drug impaired driving. Uh, I present the subject matter throughout the state and throughout New England. <clears throat> Uh, how, uh, presented at both uh, regional conferences and state conferences on these types of issues. Um, as my as my uh, friends tell me, goes you know, they say, Jay, you know, your passion is not everybody's passion, so please respect <laughs> that. And I and I totally do. Um, but uh, like everybody, um, I am on uh, the roadways. My family, uh, I live in Milton. My wife and two young sons, four and two years old. Um, and so this has my attention from a public safety um, public safety uh, concern. The Aside from that, you know, drug recognition experts, we teach this at the core. We don't have a horse in this race, uh, as in we are not trying to rule in impairment. Um, no more than we're trying to uh, rule out uh, unimpairment. It's really important that we tell the story. And so let me just uh, uh, take this kind of into two parts uh, for consumption here. And perhaps, and I'll speak slowly enough that if there are questions as we go along, I think please interrupt me. Um, and say, actually, I'd like you to maybe to elaborate on what you just said, or I don't understand that concept. Um, please, let's let's do that if you're comfortable with it in this kind of like small group conversation that we'll have this morning. Um, but first, I'll run down the drug recognition expert program, what it entails to get that credentialing, and then we can kind of parlay that into, say, cannabis uh, impairment physiology and how one becomes cannabis impaired and how this is this is a chemical is no more safe than is alcohol, as is to say. They're both dangerous. And so uh, when we talk about combining these things with driving, I mean, that's what this conversation is about today. Um, nothing in this conversation from a drug recognition expert standpoint should be construed to mean that anyone should consume less alcohol or consume less cannabis. I think that's concern for other subject matters. I know something that the um, uh, that your uh, control board certainly would take under as you kind of work through some of your issues. But for us, it's about not combining this stuff with driving. And so we're going to talk about, I guess, a little bit about kind of how we get there and, and where that comes from, why we have that concern. So uh, the DRE program, the Drug Recognition Expert Program, is not new. Uh, it's been around in this country uh, since the late 70s. Um, it was uh, conceptualized out in Los Angeles where road officers were seeing people who were DUI, but their DUI was not explained by alcohol. And so they realized there had to be some type of a program that could be established um, through best practices um, through through uh, non-novel scientific procedures to say, um, is this nervous system functioning the way it should? And if it isn't, uh, as I say, it's impaired, is it caused by medical conditions or is it caused by chemical conditions? Um, chemicals, of course, being drugs um, other than alcohol. And so this was uh, lab tested, field tested, um, and came to Vermont in 2005. Uh, I joined the program in 2006, so I was among, among the early DREs in Vermont. Um, and in Vermont, it has uh, upheld uh, the rigorous Vermont core standards by way of um, passing muster, which is to say that this is not junk science, this is not voodoo, but rather this is a prescribed program that espouses to the best known practices of multiple subject matters. And so that is not just in um, physiology and, and, and law and practice, but also on the technical advisory panel that informs this program um, sits medical doctors, ophthalmologists, uh, judicial practitioners, law enforcement, of course. Um, but these are constantly revisited every couple of years to make sure that when we talk about um, what it is to be so-called normal, as in a normal functioning uh, nervous system, we're recognizing what the best practices are to harvest that evidence. I think for the board's awareness, it's really important to understand that um, there's nothing that is um, unique with what we do that uh, other systems don't already uh, put in place. Uh, namely, say, um, medical uh, medical doctors and uh, ophthalmologists with eye exams. We don't make diagnoses here. We're not, we don't practice without a medical license as we're sometimes accused. We are uh, using the best practice of these other industries as we attempt to make good, um, good decisions by way of whether or not someone needs to be charged with DUI or not, or released without charge, charges, excuse me. Um, in 2017, the Vermont Medical Society endorsed the DRE program here, which is to say that um, these, uh, this 12 step standardized process that DREs use to be able to uh, rule in or rule out one's impairment doesn't use uh, bizarre or uh, inappropriate procedures. They're well within the ability of law enforcement to practice this and the, and the interpretations they make as a result of their procedures can be relied on. And that's from the Vermont Medical Society in 2017. Um, I'm going to share my screen here just for a moment. Um, we won't go back and forth too much. 
but I want, um, I'd like you to see what a blank face sheet looks like. Um, a blank face sheet looks like for our evaluation so you can kind of conceptualize what it is that we're talking about. Can you see this okay? It says drug influence evaluation at the top. Yep. Okay, thank you. So um, here's, here's, what, uh, here's what happens in a field setting is that a law enforcement officer, for the sake of the example here, will say that law enforcement officer is not DRE credentialed. Um, and I should, uh, I should note for the board's consideration that this is an international program. It's not just in the US, North America, but other countries in Europe as well. Uh, less than 1% less than of police officers um, are credentialed as drug recognition experts. Um, the, uh, the training that gets to now uh, this face sheet here, the training that, that goes into this is a uh, two week course. Uh, it's 72 hours of classroom. Uh, in Vermont, to even be uh, admitted to the training, one has to apply and be vetted by a board, uh, which includes uh, drug recognition expert instructors, prosecutors, and sometimes our judicial liaisons um, to make sure that the person has demonstrated good field proficiency to even enter into the training. It's a 72 hour course during which the uh, DRE candidate, we call them, uh, is tested uh, multiple times. There's an exit exam uh, as they leave the course to make sure they've understood the basic knowledge. It's a 100 question test and you'd score an 80% or better on that. And that is then that is just to access then the field training component. Um, the field certification, which in Vermont, we usually in pre COVID or non COVID times use a county jail out in Phoenix because the volume of potentially drug impaired people is so much greater than it is here in Vermont. Um, the DRE candidate needs to participate in 12 of these drug influence evaluations, six of which they need to be the hands on practitioner. They can observe the other six and they need to uh, correctly identify impairment in um, in seven of the nine evaluations. So that's a that's a 75% um, accuracy rate. That's minimum standards. Uh, our Vermont DREs uh, usually do a little better than that if they're going to be successful in their training. Um, at the end of the drug influence evaluation process, they're subjected to a comprehensive final knowledge exam, which the average DRE candidate does completes this exam in maybe four hours. Uh, sometimes it goes as long as six, seven, eight hours. Um, it's a multi part exam that is graded by or scored by two DRE instructors. Both instructors have to agree that the person has met the, the proficiencies during which it's a real knowledge dump of what that DRE candidate has learned over there. Uh, 72 hour course and then their field certification. So quite a lot goes into the DRE training uh, to maintain the certification. A DRE needs to conduct a minimum of four evaluations in a two year period and undergo eight hours of in-service training in that two year period. Um, if there's concern about interpretation ability or uh, proficiency, the DRE is benched and uh, potentially uh, decertified by uh, the state coordinator who runs our program um, because we need to hold ourselves to the high standards. We're talking about making good interpretations, which is ruling in people who are impaired and ruling out people who aren't. And so uh, to return to this, we have, let's say, a, uh, a non DRE trained police officer encounters a, uh, a operator who they suspect to be DUI. Based on the results of a preliminary breath test, that would be an alcohol road test, uh, roadside test. They don't think that the impairment is explained by DUI alcohol, they think is other drugs in play. So that person is generally brought into custody. They're brought back to the officer's police station and a drug recognition expert is then requested. And in Vermont, that is that is done by uh, either knowing that a DRE is on duty in the area or done via an, uh, an alert that is sent out to uh, cell phones and emails. So the first part of the DRE evaluation, I'm not going to I'm not going to hover on this too much. But just so you can conceptualize, the first part of the DRE evaluation, which is the top part of this face sheet, is really trying to understand: is the person um, is the person uh, appear to be impaired, and is it explained by alcohol? And we rule out alcohol by the breath test result, um, which is to say that the person is uh, under a 0.08, um, but the alcohol alone doesn't explain it, or the breath test is zeros, which certainly means that there's no alcohol involved at all. But then also, is this impairment caused by some type of medical issue? Um, we've had uh, DREs in our program um, identify people uh, early on in the process that were not drug impaired, they had medical concerns, come to find out there was a diabetic emergency, early stroke, 
undiagnosed brain aneurysm. These are cases from Vermont where a DRE has referred to emergency medicine uh, for treatment. And so um, not because the DRE recognized necessarily stroke, diabetes, um, or uh, brain aneurysm, but they recognized that it wasn't consistent with drugs and referred them to uh, emergency medicine right off. Based on the results of this preliminary examination, did the DRE considers, is this person really eligible now for the rest of the evaluation? Uh, which is to say, um, if there's any medical concern, I don't think that it's emergent. I think that this might be chemical impairment, but I'm not sure. And so we have to harvest the symptomatology to say, you know, is the nervous system functioning where it needs to? I'm going to uh, change the uh, view here for a second. Because even when we have this conversation now, but also as we continue to say into how cannabis affects um, impairment potentially, want to um, like us to consider this here. I'm drawing what I would say the bell curve of normal, right? This is where everybody in society lives. This is everyone's nervous system. So certainly most people, here's the mean, most people and their nervous system, and so what is so-called normal lives here. Chemicals affect the homeostasis of a nervous system. That's the normal functioning of the nervous system and starts to dysfunction it. And so that stuff is measurable. And that's what DREs are attempting to identify and harvest via the evaluation. And so eventually there's enough deviations from the mean, and I'm gonna show you what that face sheet looks like as far as what we actually seek to harvest. There's enough deviations from the mean here that it can only be explained by one thing. And that one thing is chemical impairment. So that's impairment by drugs. And then based on the shared symptomatology, perhaps of what the DRE is seeing, the DRE may opine what category of drugs is causing the impairment. For all of the drugs that are out there in our society, uh, the DRE program has categorized them into seven different categories. And they are in those categories because they have uh, shared symptomatology. So one of those drug categories is cannabis because cannabis, uh, if one is impaired by that, we generally expect them to have certain signs and symptoms of impairment. So again, so I, I may refer to in our conversation here, this bell curve of normal and departures from the mean. That's what I'm talking about. It's not that you know, every one person does not respond the same way that the majority does. So may a person have dilated pupils normally? Yes. May a person have bloodshot eyes normally? Yes. May they speak with slurred speech normally? Yes. But at some point, there's enough of those departures that when they coexist, they can only be explained by one thing, and that's chemical impairment. So that's really a critical concept here when we talk about interpretation. And so we may revisit that as we have our uh, conversation, but let's just walk through very briefly this face sheet. So you can look at some of the things that a DRE seeks to harvest. So we look at general, <clears throat> general indicators, which include their attitude, their coordination, how they're talking, any odors, how their face looks. What's the condition of their eyes? And they bloodshot, watery. You know, we say in the DRE program that, you know, it's, it's cute in poetry, let's say, where people say the eyes are the windows to the soul. So perhaps that's true. But what eyes literally are is they are the windows to the nervous system. And so much can be told about the health of the nervous system by the condition of the eyes. Um, in fact, for people who hold medical degrees, um, uh, illnesses can be diagnosed by eye exams. So when we talk about now chemical impairment, the eyes tell us quite a bit about the normal functioning of the nervous system. So how do the eyes look? Are they bloodshot, are they watery? Do they, uh, do they track together? How, what are the condition of the eyelids? As, as in, are they droopy or normal? Are they retracted? Is there any gaze nystagmus, which is an involuntary jerking of the eye? It's a dysfunction in the part of the brain that controls the muscles that moves the eye. We uh, run an assessment for that. We look at their pulse. We, look, we assess for convergence issues. This is the eye's ability to converge upon a stimulus. All of these, by the way, are directly tied to the driving task. And we can talk about that a little bit about, look, what do, uh, what do eye crossing have to do with safe driving? What does a jerkiness of the eye have to do with safe driving? We can talk about that uh, if, we, if we care to. Um, but as we continue our harvesting here, um, in addition to the pulse, we run them through divided attention tests where we assess, can the person do one, two, three, four co-occurring tasks. The huge rub in this is that these tests are relatively simple. 
They're designed where the unimpaired nervous system uh, functions quite well through them. But as the nervous system starts to dysfunction, we start to see the clues, um, again, the clues of impairment that says that the divided attention ability is compromised. Uh, we then uh, continue with uh, vitals, other vitals, which includes blood pressure, temperature, uh, pupil size estimation. What's the condition of their mouth or their oral cavity? The eyes reaction to light. Uh, condition of the integumentary system, the skin, as far as injection site burns and so forth. And what's their muscle tone? So then, at the end of all of this, this is a this is a ten step process. Um, we uh, steeries make an opinion. And that opinion is, do I think the person is impaired? Do I think that impairment is chemical? And if so, what category of drugs is it? And you see here at the bottom what the opinion is. And then the 12th and final step is a toxicology request. So in Vermont, that is blood. So I think I might put a pin in that for now, because that's like, <laughs> I feel like that's a lot. So I can put a pin in it as far as just coming back to say the DRE program or protocol generally, as far as what we're talking about before we even pivot into say cannabis physiology, um, uh, physiology of that impairment. I'd love to hear your questions or comments if there are any. Questions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so you go through this 10 step process. There's a determination at the end and then a request for a toxicology report. So do you have any data on margin of error where there's a toxicology report requested and then the person is not intoxicated in any way? So the uh, in, in uh, a correct opinion um, is defined as a DRE, say, opines uh, the person is impaired by cannabis and cannabis comes back in the blood. So that would be considered a, say, correct opinion. Um, in that way, Vermont, uh, as a program, uh, and I can give you specific percentages, but we're somewhere north of 85% accurate across all opinions, which is to say that we opine that we have someone is impaired and at least one of those drugs comes back in the blood. So, for example, a DRE may say, I think their person is impaired by cannabis and central nervous system stimulants, and only cannabis comes back, programmatically, that is still considered a correct opinion, even though it wasn't corroborated by stimulants. I think one of the important um, concepts here is that a DRE might be wrong about the category causing the opinion, but they're still right that the person is impaired. And I think that that's, really, uh, that's a really important uh, crossroads to understand. But in Vermont, we're north of 85% accurate with toxicology confirmation. Jay, thanks for being here. Um, uh, sure. Quick question about, about process, just so I understand when that DRE sheet kind of comes into play. So if somebody is pulled over and, and an officer uh, makes a determination that, that they're likely um, impaired by some other substance than alcohol, then this this takes place typically back at a, at a police station. Is, is that correct? This isn't like a roadside test? That's that's right. This is a evaluation done in a control setting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jay, I don't want to preempt you here, but um, you know, we've heard a lot about kind of roadside saliva tests, and that's certainly kind of a political football or lightning rod at the legislature. Um, even if we had one, we don't have any nationally recognized impairment standards like five nanograms in the blood means you're impaired, like we do. Um, have for alcohol, 0 0.08. Um, so to me, the way I see it is we're always going to need DREs to um, be able to kind of explain the signs of impairment that, you know, explain, and then that they're explained through, um, you know, the, the cannabis or they're, they're, they're verified through the toxicology report. So can you speak a little bit about, um, you know, the geographic distribution of DREs in the state? I mean, again, I don't know if you're planning on doing this later, that's fine, but, um, and also maybe some of their response times and whether that, that's sufficient. So, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks so much for those the two part questions. So, I think just uh, taking kind of the first thing what you said is that it, it is so important to appreciate that presence of a chemical in a person's blood actually tells us nothing about whether or not they're impaired. So in Vermont, with DUI alcohol law, we have a per se limit, 0 0.08 or more, is where everyone is presumed impaired, no matter what you think your tolerance is. Vermont DUI law also says that any impairment at all, to the slightest degree, is also DUI, because people do become impaired before 0.08.
By the time we get to 0.08, that's where science tells us everybody has become dysfunctioning. Okay, so the analogy I like to use because sometimes we hear drugs and now suddenly we start to, you know, think that this is somehow more complicated than it really is. Let's let's take this in the way of alcohol still. So if I have a, if I'm not drinking Starbucks here, I'm drinking a Bud Light, I could have a sip of a Bud Light and I would be positive for alcohol in my blood. I think we all can understand that pretty simply, but does that mean that I'm impaired? No, but yet I'm positive for alcohol. So when we talk about presence of uh, drugs in addition to alcohol, so we're talking about cannabis today, simply being positive for cannabinoids in my blood doesn't tell us anything about whether I am impaired or not. And that's where drug recognition metrics become a critical part of the story. And this is what forensic toxicologists tell us. This is what researchers who have studied uh, can cannabis and cannabinoids for a generation, right, tell us is that uh, whether it is saliva or blood or urine, however it is that a state chooses to harvest toxicology, it, it tells us only that if something is positive or not, um, it does not tell us anything about whether the person is impaired by that. When we talk about legal limits, some people well, with cannabis uh, show uh, psychophysical impairment uh, below five nanograms. Some people show it above. Right. And so someone and so uh, contrapositively, one could have, have 20 nanograms in their blood and not be impaired. So, again, like a, a number is only just a number. And I think we must get out of our own way with that, which is to say that it is going back to that face sheet. I'll spare you the screen share on it again. <laughs> but if we go back to the back to the face sheet, it is the 100 plus clues and indicators to make sure that we are when we say somebody is impaired, we can point to exactly how that is as far as how the nervous system is dysfunctioning. So um, when we talk about DRE involvement, this becomes a great concern. So in Vermont, we have 48 active DREs. Um, troopers account for about a third of the program, uh, which makes sense because we're the largest agency as well. But uh, there's 48 active DREs. We have six candidate DREs that we've just put through an application process. They have not yet started this, um, their, their classroom training on that, but that will add to the 48. Geographic distribution, I think it's easier to talk about where we lack versus where we're strong. Um, where we lack is in the Northeast Kingdom, which is really Orleans, Essex, Caledonia. We lack there. We are, uh, that is our greatest area of need. Uh, down in the uh, southeastern part of the corner, we are also lacking, although it's not as diminished as Northeast, um, which is like Wyndham County um, struggle. And then in the Southwest, we're not as um, well represented. Central Vermont, Northwestern Vermont is pretty good um, as far as representation. When we think about what happens here is that a DRE may be on duty or they may not be on duty. But when we talk about from the time the blue lights come on as in the seizure of a human being now, a DRE may not actually be involved for potentially an hour plus. Um, that 12 step process that we've talked about briefly takes about, depending on the DRE speed and how much um, like interview they're putting into the person, interviews can last a little while, um, but generally about 35, 40, 45 minutes long to work through those 12 steps. Um, in Vermont, uh, as of last year or a year and a half ago, we can now uh, get blood from paramedics at a police station. So we can call a rescue squad in to, uh, to uh, do a venipuncture at a, the, the site of uh, the PD before we would have to go to an emergency department, which then was not only not only takes critical ED resources away from people who are there, but also sometimes um, um, suspected DUI um, offenders can be violent and profane. And that's really hard to subject people who are there for a medical crisis to that type of stuff as well. So um, in that way, it shortened the time, but from a DRE, from the moment of blue lights come on, the time this person is actually released could be hours. And so um, the better we can be with geographic equity, I think we can you know, reduce that. I think when we talk about you know saliva and so forth, I think the greatest the greatest benefit I think a saliva would give us, um, uh, even from a from a, a roadside model, is that you have a non DRE trained officer who is seeing someone who's not functioning right. Maybe it's mental health, maybe some other medical issue, uh, or maybe it's drugs, and the saliva can help them rule in or rule out: is this chemically based or is it non chemically based? By way of if I'm seeing all these signs of impairment and we're positive for drugs, then I think I have enough now to take the person and we'll keep going. But absent that ability to rule somebody and rule somebody out, then I really have to continue custody and get a DRE because I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to do. So there's certainly some great value to that. Um, 
I am looking at my notes here as far as other, uh, did I answer your question there, Mr. Pepper? About, yeah, it, um, it sparked another question though, um, which is, uh, you know, you've got the medical rule out and then you've got the alcohol rule out. Um, does that, I can't remember quite from my, from the course, um, does that alcohol rule out occur even if there's suspected chemical interaction as well, other than alcohol? Like, so if someone, if a, if a DRE suspects alcohol and cannabis, but they blow 0.08, uh, do they not proceed with the DRE evaluation for cannabis? That's, that's right. And so, um, and that, and that is not a DRE program, uh, standard. That's really a, say a legal streamlined, uh, consideration. We'll just say if they're if they're over 0 0.08 on a data master, we tend to just pursue alcohol, even if we suspect other uh, other chemicals are in play. So in that way, these numbers are really underrepresented. Um, the Vermont Forensic Lab did a really interesting analysis um, recently, which was when someone is taken into custody for DUI alcohol, they're afforded the opportunity to have an independent blood test. So alcohol is through breath testing. Right? Um, but after they're released, the, uh, the, the, su the, uh, the suspect is able to go to a hospital and get blood for their own purposes. Now, once they get that, uh, once they get that blood, it gets stored at the Department uh, of Health here in Waterbury. Uh, and it's not tested unless they actually complete that process. So there's a lot of samples that sit here and never get tested. So they just, so they, our lab was able to get some funding to test those samples that were just, just, I use that term loosely, just alcohol case, DUI cases to see what are we missing with other drugs. And uh, I don't have the results in front of me to be able to speak intelligently about that. Um, they found though, I think quite intuitively that we are missing other drugs as well um, through just alcohol cases. And I think what's really interesting is that we, um, I think we, we don't arrest our way out of the DUI problem. Okay, I think we can appreciate that. When we're talking about DUI arrest, we're arresting a symptom of a perhaps an underlying issue. And I think we have someone who is DUI um, on, on above a 0.08, but there's also cannabis involved or also other drugs involved. Well, that does nothing to help us as far as a system intervening within that person to, for counseling and substance use and abuse and things like this types of education to try to understand how, how far does this, does, if there's a problem, how far does it go and what is it caused by? Because whether it's um, opioids or cannabinoids or alcohol, treatment models are slightly different here, depending on you know, what the substance is. I think it's easy for someone to admit, oh yeah, I'm just drunk, when really it's drunk on alcohol and also other drugs are causing the story as well. And so um, that, that's only to propose this as a, as a concept. I don't know that there's a, there's certainly not an easy fix here, but I think that it's, um, we don't necessarily do ourselves any favors if we're not really tracing as, a, as the best that we can. Unfortunately, the only time we tend to really get into the into the meat of this is in a felonious investigation, which is there's a serious crash, somebody's life is irreparably changed because of injury or death, um, and then we tend to roll out the resources then. But now we're even responding even now to something that is, um, unfortunately, it's already been done. Um, so uh, that may have been yeah. a little. Uh, a little long-winded no, for what you're looking for there. Very helpful. Can I go back to the geographic distribution for a second? Um, yes, of when course. an officer goes to the class, is it the sending town or sheriff's department that sends that pays for that? How is that paid for for that officer? So the um, the DRE program will cover salary of the person who's there, um, but and this is where it gets complicated is that but now I've left a vacancy at the I'm making up Orleans County Sheriff's Office. And so that requires some type of ship coverage often, which then which then goes against that place's budget. Um, so money is always, of course, a concern there. Um, I think you know, I think that chiefs, sheriffs, and our own um, uh, BSP administration they'll they'll shoulder that burden. Um, I I haven't heard of a chief or a sheriff um, or any of our command staff balking at one you know needing to do that. Um, however, um, it uh, hurts the bottom line. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not free. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I just had a clarifying question. So I think what I heard you say is from this like roadside saliva testing perspective, at least where we are now from a technology standpoint, that's, that could be another tool in an officer's tool belt to identify whether or not a DRE test is appropriate, but it 
it's nothing more than that right now. It, it, it can't um, be used to, like the breathalyzer test can, in a sense, to automatically well, identify. I'll write that. I, I, yes, I, I, um, if I understand what you're saying, um, uh, you know, clearly enough, I think that the idea is that because that, you know, the re research certainly does not support a per se limit for any drugs, um, cannabis or other drugs, a per se limit, I don't think we should ever go down that road. And the data and the, um, the research doesn't support that um, okay. in the way that it does for alcohol. Um, but certainly it's another tool in that officer's toolbox, as we say, to make a good roadside detention decision. You know, there's 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 two fatal errors uh, that are cardinal sins as a as a, a DUI instructor when I teach the whether you're a DUI basic police officer, whether it's um, the intermediate program, which is the so-called A ride, advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, or the DRE program. Um, two cardinal sins can be made. One is we take into custody somebody who isn't impaired, right? But worse is we release somebody roadside and let them keep driving who is impaired, right? At least on the front end. We have an officer who made a decision based on what they thought was going on. A DRE can come in and um, and evaluate and then rule out to say that, yep, I think this is a medical issue, essentially, or they have some cognitive issues or so forth, um, not caused by chemicals. But what mustn't happen is that an officer not be afforded, say, every tool, every element of training to make sure that they're making good decisions roadside is that people who are brought into custody are ones who have some legitimate concern not explained um, by medical or something else. And I think that the saliva piece does help that uh, for officers who don't have the elevated level of training. That said, you know, no test is perfect. You know, I think that's really important to understand that. So like, I think there may be some people leaving on our call who will eventually watch this video who will say, my gosh, uh, the Vermont DRE program has 85% success rate. That's not actually not what that statistic means, right? We're talking about toxicology corroboration is what that you know percentage means. Um, if we're asking any scientific test or law enforcement test or or um, educational test to give us 100% success, we'll never get there. Um, and the analogy I like to use to try to uh, maybe bridge the gap with some of the eye rolling maybe I get sometimes is that um, the PSA test, which is the prostate specific antigen test for um, prostate cancer. Um, it's a number result uh, for, for, for men and for prostate um, to, to identify if they have prostate cancer or not. That is notoriously bad as a test for both false positives and false negatives. And I'll, I'll share a, you know, a, person, a personal background here is that my godfather died from metastasized prostate cancer a few years ago, and he was a false negative case. Now, he had symptoms of prostate cancer, but his PSA was low. He's like, oh, well, I don't have prostate cancer. He didn't get the help that he needed, and he ended up metastasizing, and, and sadly, he, he passed away. When I talk about false positive rates, I mean that 70% of people who have, a fall, who have a high PSA go in for a biopsy now and come to find out they actually don't have prostate cancer. But here's why I mentioned that. Because society tolerates the PSA. It's the best thing that we have. It's the best thing that we know. And no problem, right? No problem. It's a system doing the best that they can. And so in the DRE sense, um, from both the laboratory settings and the field settings where this program was inceptioned, we're talking about a 90% plus uh, accurate rate. That's that's uh, 92, that's 92 and a half percent in a field study. We made uh, correct arrest decisions based on drug impairment and then actual drugs came back. Um, in seven and a half percent of the times they made a impairment arrest decision and no drugs came back in toxicology. So then the question is, and this is where it becomes unknown, is that because the person was not drug impaired or because toxicology was below reporting limits? It was some type of you know, fancy substance, they wouldn't test for things like that. But I think what, I, what we focus on is the 92 and a half percent success rate with this program. So again, it just speaks to the need for the training. Not every officer can or should be a DRE, um, but certainly officers in a patrol function can or should be a ride trained, right? That gives them that advanced DUI stuff. So maybe we're pivoting the conversation there, but I don't know if, um, if anybody you know, cares to have that conversation, but um, training here is so, so, so important because um, I think if I can, you know, be a little bit philosophical for a second. I and others really do believe um, I'm, I'm like a disciple of Maslow's hierarchy and if people are familiar with that. You know, and it's this at the peak of the pyramid is that self-actualization. That's people achieving their best. You know, some of uh, a few great years before I was promoted and I had to give it up was I was, I was an adjunct faculty at Community College of Vermont and I taught a couple of courses over there and I was gifted with uh, teaching, a teaching excellence award um, based on some student nominations. So I was, very, I was quite touched by it. And um, 
And what I've become quite taken by in my life is that the need, say, for the human spirit to be the best that they can. So I think about law enforcement role in our society. We can't necessarily really help with that first rung, which is physiological needs, I'm talking about food and water and things like this. But where law enforcement comes in is the next rung, and that is safety and security. And so what we are trying to do is not about arresting or getting people in trouble. That's not it at all. It is to really identify perhaps symptoms of a problem to then divert to another system for treatment model and so forth to really help that person, not just not be a potential threat to other people on our highways, but for themselves to be able to kind of elevate, escalate themselves to that self-actualization, the best that they can be for themselves. Sometimes these substances get in the way of that. And so unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you look at it, law enforcement might be that first piece to get there. And so DREs can't and necessarily won't be everywhere, but boy, you know, A-ride people can perhaps to try to get this system, you know, funneled in the right direction in the absence of a DRE. And so, um, you're still here, so I guess you didn't lose you with that completely, but <laughs> just, a little, just a little bit of philosophy here about what I see is our role out there. Um, it is as essential to rule in somebody who's impaired as it is to rule out that they're not. And DREs are not trying to make either case. We're simply following um, following the symptomatology where it takes us. Can I, can I ask you just two related questions about the roadside saliva? And I just, uh, it's only because I've followed this conversation so so many over the years, so closely over the years. Um, but but one, where, if you had that tool in your tool belt, should it come into play? Because you, I mean, you certainly don't want kind of confirmation bias or whatever the kind of biases of that result influencing the rest of the test. But you also want to be able to rule people out early if there is no impairment. And then two, um, if uh, the presence of the substance cannabis um, does not correlate to impairment, why do you need that tool at all? And I, I know you've touched on that a little bit, but um, uh, if you could speak to, to both of those, and then maybe we can move away from saliva testing because it is kind of not a decision for the board, certainly. Um, it's, it's not in our jurisdiction at all. So the um, Vermont law is fairly clear about say preliminary testing in general. So that's a preliminary breath test, a handheld test we do roadside, um, and then, of course, roadside saliva is something that you say is a nuclear football. But the um, on the front end of this, the um, pulmonary breath testing really should should or shall shall only be done when there's a suspicion of impairment already. And so the point is, like, yes, uh, can confirmation bias. I think I'm pretty sensitive to that, certainly, which is um, I administer a breath test. The person is a 0.18 BAC. Therefore, everything I see must be because they're alcohol impaired. Or now more concerningly, because it's not as clean as alcohol, um, they're positive on a cannabis test. Oh, everything I see means that they are impaired by cannabis. Like that's devastating and leads us into those cardinal sins I talked about a few minutes ago. So they, so if it ever were to be a thing, it would be at the end of a process when the officer already has observed certain signs or symptoms of impairment and now is wondering, well, what's the cause of it? Um, it would be presumably post even preliminary alcohol breath test because it's again alcohol that I'm explaining what I'm seeing. Um, and therefore, is this a medical issue or is it chemically driven? And so I think that that test helps us helps us make that um, get, off, get off that decision making fence. When we talk about well, why, like who cares? What's the point anyway? Because it doesn't mean anything. Well, because there are conditions out there that may be emergent, medically emergent. And so if we're delaying this a half hour, 45 minutes for a DRE to come along and then say, whoa, we have an emergency here, like we got to we have to you know, get them to a hospital. That may be a literal matter of life or death. And so um, there's a screen splicker on me, but so that might uh, be a yeah. literal. There we go. Um, it might be a literal matter of life or death. So therefore, an officer can say, look, I see these signs of impairment. I'm not sure if it's chemical or medical um, and they're negative on a saliva test. Then that may indicate to that officer that, OK, this is something medical and I'm going to go this other hospital route. Um, so uh, I think, again, it just helps to, to frame the picture of what what should I do with this person next? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I have another, yeah. since you brought up philosophy, so I'm not quite sure how related this is to the conversation, but you were talking about philosophy earlier, and I do think there's a, a level of public trust that has to exist in these programs, right? And you've explained these very well. You touched on this a little bit. Do you see the DRE and A-RIDE as sort of the, the guardian approach to law enforcement in, in terms of those the, the pillars of community policing? Uh, I, I do, in fact, and I, I um, 
And the term that uh, I use and probably overuse it is the capable guardians. And I say that, you know, you arm, you arm uh, a human being with uh, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of, say, uh, identifying impairment. And therefore, um, you know, being a guardian is in like putting yourself between this and that is a guardian. But the capable guardian is somebody who now, okay, now I make good decisions as a guardian. And I think that I do see, yes, I see a ride as a function of that and the DRE being, being in our, what we know right now with our stuff is simply, it is the best training we can afford. So when we talk about impairment detection, um, a ride by contrast, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, but a ride is a 16 hour course, um, with no prerequisites. Um, and, and, my, and my opinion should be, uh, well, it, it is mandated for all police officers hired post 2015. So the Academy already mandates that. Um, but in BSP land, we take it so seriously that all of our road troopers are trained as a ride people, uh, whether or not they were hired before after 2015, because again, it is about, um, it is about arming our guardians to make them capable guardians with the knowledge skills and abilities to make good decisions. And that's not just those cardinal sins we talked about, about allowing an impaired person to go away. I always think, you know, my, my parents are snowbirds. They only live in Vermont a few months out of the year now. I grew up in Montpelier. Um, they, how would I want my mother treated? You know, who's tired at the end of the night, coming back from babysitting through two grandkids and she encounters a police officer. You know, I want, I want her treated with respect, of course, but I also would not want her brought into custody um, because of something medical she may have going on. Like she needs help and it's not handcuffs. She needs help. And I think that training really helps us make sure that we go the health route, the capable guardians, not this other way. Um, and, I, and I do think as, as a trainer here, of course, this is a self-aggrandizing statement. As a trainer, I think that we are an instructor cadre who really believes in that philosophically. It's so essential. Um, and I know I'm getting worked up. I'm using my hands now too much. So I'm going to try and go. For it. <laughs> thank you. That was, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Jay, before we move on to kind of the other thing that I asked you to talk about, which is the kind of physiological response, um, the central nervous response. Um, could you just briefly say, uh, so 2015 A-Ride became mandatory at uh, the academy, right? That's right. So every officer, um, whether they're VSP, local, um, you know, county sheriffs, um, they're all A-RIDE trained if they graduated the academy post-2015. That's right. And, and uh, you, you may or may not know, but there's also a mandate to the Criminal Justice Training Council to um, figure out how to train anyone who might be involved in a roadside stop with um, A-RIDE training. I forget the date. I think it's like five to six years out or something like that. Is that a good kind of backstop to the uh, DRE program? Because I know that um, I've seen, I've had the conversation many times about uh, having kind of on-call DREs and how difficult that could be for these smaller departments, for these kind of underserved, underserved areas. But is that A-RIDE training kind of a good backstop for, um, for the kind of DRE program? Uh, I, I think it is a good, back, I think it's a good backstop. I think that, um, you know, we have a couple of uh, Supreme, Vermont Supreme Court decisions on the books. One of them is State v. Rifkin. Um, which which identifies that if evidence of impairment is going to be admissible, it has to be done so via an expert. And so absent a DRE, that evidence may not be admissible, which means that case can't be prosecuted effectively. Um, a ride training now, the way that the statute was um, was adjusted in this last uh, this last session, um, affords for both a ride and DRE a ride trained people and DRE trained people for their testimony to be um, admissible in court from a statutory um, at a statutory level. Which, which actually is incredible. I think there's only, I think Maine is the only other state that has it written into statute. So yes, so yes, it, um, Mr. Pepper, that is exactly, I think, a good backstop for when a DRE can't be available, um, an A-ride, a, a, a capable trained A-ride person um, can respond. That said, um, DREs, uh, there are a few of us who do DRE work post-incident. So we call that DRE reconstructions. I won't go into that too deep, except to say that if the evidence is harvested from the beginning, by a capable A-Ride trained police officer, we can look at that evidence, body cam reports and so forth, to then apply some of our DRE knowledge to say, you know, to either, to either again, rule in or rule out that we think that this was chemical impairment. Um, and that and that has been um, allowed in courts as well. So, um, but we, we can't get there unless we have the A-Ride people who are supporting that. Thank you. Anything else on DREs um, or A-Ride? I don't think so. Okay, 
Jay, we have about 15 minutes left. Can you, uh, is that, does that work for you? It is, yeah, let, let, let me tell you everything I know about cannabis in 15 minutes. This is gonna get, <laughs> this is gonna get violent. <laughs> let's put our helmets on. Um, so let's just give like a 30,000 foot fly over here, um, which is uh, simply under the big macro concept that there's, whether it is simply things that I hear, but is not shared by the majority of the public or not, I'm not sure. Cannabis, when we talk about driving, is no more or no less safe than is alcohol and driving. That's really important to understand. That if, and if people are saying, look, actually using cannabis makes me a better driver, like that's not true. I think I actually know where that comes from. And I, I think I'd like to speak to that here a little bit when we talk about the physiology and so forth, or occasional users versus chronic, more frequent users. Something actually happens with brain chemistry there. Um, and we talk about that a little bit, but, uh, Again, I, 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 I love this stuff, but I'm going to stay uh, focused here on the physiology piece, which is um, the, uh, I'm assuming, not necessarily for the board here, but anyone who may watch this later, I'm going to assume for a moment, say like no cannabis knowledge, just for just for a second, as far as where I'll address this at, which is um, uh, from the platform that I'll speak to. So the endogenous cannabinoid system is essential to our critical survival functions. This is a widely predominant system that affects many of our, our major systems, which is our hunger, body temperature, memory, fear. It's a major body system. The, uh, it is critical with our functioning homeostasis. That's what keeps us feeling normal. And when I say functioning normal, I mean unimpaired, right? So it's a really critical system. The concern is that cannabis stimulates this system. And it, really, and, it, and it has the potential to hijack it away from its normal functioning. And it does that because it, it cannabis binds with two different receptors. One is a psychoactive receptor. Psychoactive means feeling the effects of, that's where impairment lives. There's CB1 and CB2. So Delta 9 THC, Delta 8, uh, something we were learning more about, um, this binds to CB1. And CB1 has the psychoactive effects. And I'll talk about kind of the wide predominance of this in a moment of why it's deleterious to the driving task. But CB2, that's where really um, uh, CBD, cannabidiol, that's where the oil uh, binds. And that is not known to have any psychoactive effects. So CB1, when, that's, when that is, when that is uh, bound to by a cannabinoid chemical, it activates this endogenous cannabinoid system. And it is widely distributed in our brain. There are so many brain systems that have CB1 receptors. And if I have a cannabinoid chemical that binds a receptor and now it turns that on, in this case, it releases these chemicals that now starts to dysfunction the nervous system. So that includes, now you think about um, some of the medicinal reason, uh, uh, applications of cannabis, which let's say stimulating appetite with people who suffer from um, anorexia or uh, people with um, uh, negative side effects from chemotherapy with nausea and so forth. The reason that it helps with that is because the hypothalamus that controls our appetite has a lot is dense with CB1 receptors. The brainstem, the cerebellum back here, um, uh, the, or rather the brainstem and spinal cord that controls nausea, dense with CB1 receptors. So that may help with some of the side effects and some of the medicinal uh, medicinal benefits potentially. But now we're talking about driving, and think for a second about the incredibly intense. Uh, needs that driving requires. Look, everybody here who has a uh, uh, driver's license was at one point a new driver. And think about whether it was your your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your family friend who was teaching you to drive, what that was like in that parking lot, however many years ago that was, which was slamming on the brakes, fast accelerator, jerking up the wheel, you know, dad grabbing the, oh my gosh, bar, right? At least that was my experience because we are trying to teach our nervous system all of the things to, to, to do this well, which is feeling the steering wheel, feeling the pedal, meet, enough pressure, not enough pressure, inputs, outputs, seeing and feeling the environment around us, the light that turns from red to green, yellow this, the stop sign, the kid in the crosswalk. When we're driving home today, think about, my gosh, all the things I'm keeping track of while I'm driving. Now, Parts of our brain that are so dense with the CB1 receptor, and again, CB1 is a psychoactive receptor with cannabinoids, is the basal ganglia, uh, basal ganglia controls motor control and planning. The amygdala, which is where anxiety, our emotions, our fear lives, our fight or flight, fright uh, part of our brain. Now, we don't, uh, I'm, I'm very well connected with our Vermont drivers and traffic safety educators. These are our driver's ed instructors. We don't want anxious drivers driving around. But when we use cannabis and we feel relaxed as a result of that, 
What's actually happening beneath the integumentary, inside the brain chemistry, is the amygdala now is dysfunctioning, right? We want actually drivers who, who care driving around. We don't want scared drivers. We want drivers who, though, are attuned to the potential that bad things may happen. I'm going to respond effectively to that. Like that's what our neighbors want. That's what our families want. So the, that 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 is that is dysfunction. Um, the neocortex. That's where cognitive function, sensory data integration. That's all that, all that happens. Uh, hippocampus, memory and learning, all dense with CB1 receptors. The idea is that someone who's using cannabis, um, an unimpaired person, uses a very small part of their brain to work through a problem. But when someone is impaired by cannabis, because these, it is so widely uh, affected, it takes a large part of the brain to work through that same problem. Therefore, it leaves less of the brain available to deal with co-occurring issues. So as, you know, as the, the trainings I've been through, and I've, I've, uh, I've spent um, a week out in California, and in addition to my DRE basic training, I've had many, many hours of advanced training since then. I've had a 24-hour uh, forensic pharmacology course, I've been through a week-long drugs and human behavior course in California, taught by the world's experts of the sub of the subject matter. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit through an eight-hour Society of Forensic Toxicologists uh, workshop by the world's experts just on cannabinoids. And what they all agree is that you may drive, one may drive safe nine out of 10 times being impaired on cannabis because during those nine times, something unintended didn't happen. But on the 10th time, that's where the deer runs out. That's where the um, that's where the gentleman in the crosswalk dropped his keys. And that was unanticipated. And now I hit the person. Right. So this idea that I drive somehow safer, I think I know I said in there early in the beginning, I think I know where that where that comes from, which is that there are driving studies, quite a few of them, as a matter of fact, that talk about um, cannabinoids and safe driving or is it deleterious to the driving tax? And one of the uh, highly quoted studies, and by the way, I'll, I'll take a sidebar here to say that the, the people whose names are on these, these studies, the people who have dedicated their professional lives to this type of subject matter, they all are, they had this uh, panel, it was really interesting to hear them kind of talk shop. They're quite disturbed that whether you're pro-cannabis or anti-cannabis, both parties like to hijack little sentences of what they say to fulfill their ends, right? So that got my attention. I think that's really interesting, right? Take little pieces just to make it work. But here's what they all kind of, they all kind of agree on. Right, which is that when we are uh, talking about uh, the acute effects, um, uh, they're, they're felt uh, when one is inhaling it, so that's smoking or vaping, the acute effects are felt, start to feel within a few minutes and peak about 30 minutes. Impairment tends to persist two to three hours and then starts to, the subjective high, the person feeling the high starts to then, uh, starts to then uh, return to normal. Now, I said earlier that bell curve of normal, not every one person responds the way that the majority of people do to cannabis. And that's, you know, depends on their dose, their tolerance, their age or gender, what they've had to eat, right? Uh, perhaps their mood that day. It varies from time to time, uh, from use to use. And so therefore, not every one person responds the way the majority does. However, they say that the majority of people remain impaired for about four hours after use. And here's the thing that I think has really complicated consequences for Vermont, um, if we wanted to espouse to this uh, or prescribe to this type of thinking. The experts all agree. When asked, how long should someone refrain from the driving task if I'm using cannabis? They all agree, 12 to 24 hours. So how do you do that in a place like Vermont with no meaningful public transportation? Or if I'm out at a, uh, in a, some future decade from now, a, um, a place where, um, I don't know what the technical term would be for somewhere to use cannabis, um, you know, you know, in a, in a bar or something. Um, how would I get home, right? Versus um, having uh, alcohol earlier in the day. Alcohol linearly metabolizes. It's absorbed at a known rate, and it's eliminated at a known rate. That's a critical difference between alcohol and and cannabis. Alcohol has an affinity for water. Cannabis has an affinity for uh, fatty tissue, uh, the adipose tissue, and that lives in the brain. And so when we talk about blood results of cannabis. It leaves the blood very quickly as it crosses the blood brain barrier very easily and lives in the fatty tissues in the brain. And that's why impairment tends to linger even after the even after the user uh, two to three hours uh, after post acute, they start to return to a feeling of normal, but they have residual effects of the impairment and they're not aware of it. That's the concern is that users who are three, four, five hours post use are still showing signs of impairment, potentially up to 24 hours 
As some studies have shown, not for everybody. You say that to a jury of 12 people, they'll laugh you out of the room. You know, uh, that's, that's, you know, but, but simply for some, they, that it tends to linger, right? Uh, some of the studies show that we talk about with cognitive um, dysfunctioning, a slowed down response to the nervous system, can linger for chronic frequent users for two to three weeks. Again, try to explain that to somebody who, who needs to go to work on Monday, right? Australia, as far as a, a, a country uh, who has medicinal cannabis as a country, the Australian government recommends that if you're a medicinal cannabis user, refrain from driving for 24 hours. So that's Australia. It's interesting whether, um, so to return to this idea of well, where did this idea come from, if there are studies that get hijacked to say I'm a safe driver, is that out in Iowa, there's a beautiful driving simulator. It's a massive, massive driving simulator. And they study various effects and um, uh, to include cannabinoid effects in driving. And there, it's not ethical to dose people to street level amounts. And so they relatively low potency THC studies um, below what the person may even take as far as the recreational use. They find that person drives slower. So that one little piece tends to have gotten hijacked to say, oh, look, I, I use cannabis. I'm a slower driver. Well, meanwhile, it's still slowed reaction times. It's we interlane weaving. They call it standard deviation of lateral position. That's science for weaving. Just call it weaving, for God's sake. So weaving, right? Uh, and that's where I wonder about like our fatal crashes worth. Like, why are people who are uh, driving um, impaired on cannabis, if they're crashing, why is this data perhaps overrepresented in our fatal crash statistics uh, other, compared to other drugs? And I'm just wondering, I don't know, I'm wondering, um, first of all, in an enforcement setting, we find that if people are impaired on cannabis, they're driving much faster. It's high speed stops and weaving. And so my friends who I work with who are crash reconstructionists, they tell me, look, Jay, you know, if someone's going to not survive a crash, it's not the impact, it's the deceleration that happens next. And so if you have a, a moving object that hits something head on and decelerates quickly, like our organs can't survive that. And so I think about um, uh, uh, any type of chemical, by the way, alcohol also results in speed driving, by the way, and weaving and so forth, right? Like both these things are dangerous. The takeaway here is we mustn't be combining this and driving. I said at the very beginning on the onset, none of this should be construed to be that the state police need people to refrain from using cannabis whether legal or not. That's not, that's nothing. We're talking about driving. We're talking about combining the two and driving. That's so important. Um, the, uh, the, as far as just the, the, the functioning piece of this, the, um, when somebody, um, starts to metabolize the, uh, the active metabolites out of their blood, but the, they tend to linger with the impairment effects. It's called a counterclockwise hysteresis, and that's what cannabinoids do. So it's as the, it leaves the blood, the effects are felt after it's actually out of the blood because it's lingering in the brain. I think it's really important to appreciate that. So when we think about blood levels of THC, again, it doesn't tell us anything because we're not talking about um, a level in a blood. We're talking about we're talking about observable symptomatology of impairment. And so I think that when we have observable symptomatology of impairment, it doesn't matter what the number is. This person on this day is impaired. This is not a character assessment or some type of characterization about what their habits are. No, we're talking about what you did on this day was it was unsafe and rendered you a dangerous driver. And that's how this happened. And by the way, the opposite is also true. Um, we train police officers to be very clear that you smell the odor of burnt cannabis in a car that says nothing about cannabis. A person tells you that they smoke that says, or used, that says nothing about whether or not they're impaired. Like, don't go into the rabbit hole, as I like to say with them. That's not, that says nothing. But if we're seeing the dilated pupils, the bloodshot eyes, the slowed reaction, the slowed speech, that's a concern. And so to kind of tighten it up uh, in our last few moments here about why this is impairment, you think about what cannabis does to the nervous system. It's both a, it's almost both a stimulant and a depressant to where it does elevate some of our vitals and the acute impairment, elevated pulse, elevated blood pressure, but slows down our thinking. Is that if I'm driving down the street and I, my system is slowed down because of cannabis, I'm perceiving that I'm going slower than everything else around me. And so what do I do to compensate for that? I go faster. And that's where in my professional experience, I find, I find people going 80 in a 40, where people on the air say 120 in a 65. Right. And they really don't they really don't understand that they were speeding. Because, again, it's a hijacking 
of the endogenous cannabinoid system that is widely dispersed in the brain that affects the ability to perceive uh, to perceive the environment around them. So I know it's 11 o'clock, so uh, I'll stop there again. This is, you know, cannabis alone is a, uh, I think it's a three hour block in our DRE course. I did it in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I apologize for anyone I gave a bloody nose to there, but I tried my best. Oh, well. Always leave a morning more, right, Jay? Oh, there it is. There yeah. it is. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all your work in this in this realm. Thank you for being an instructor uh, of our DRE program. I think, um, you know, we got the crash course, but the it's just endlessly fascinating. Um, and we didn't even get to kind of the poly substance and the interactions between cannabis and other substances. Um, but... Um, Maybe that's a, a topic for another day. Um, so, so thank you so much. And I forgot to mention, just like our last witness, uh, today is Jay's day off. So he joined us uh, on his day off <laughs> because this is um, such an important issue um, for both. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting at uh, headquarters in Waterbury. My wife thinks I'm out getting a gallon of milk. <laughs> 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 Make sure she doesn't watch this video. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I, I, I really respect what um, you know what we're doing, uh, what you're doing here. So I thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. So next on our agenda, um, Robin, are you are you with us? I think I saw your phone number pop up. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. So. Um, hey. <laughs> So, Robin, um, let me make sure I get your title right. You're the Director of Research at the Crime Research Group. You have a JD, you have a PhD. Um, I've worked with you very closely over the years in the racial disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Panel. Um, CRG is a objective data analysis um, service for the state. And I stress that objective because in the cannabis policy dis discussions that I've been a part of, data gets thrown around a lot and statistics get thrown around a lot uh, to either disprove or prove a point. And um, with your background and your knowledge, we thought it'd be important to hear from you about kind of what CRG does, the data you can collect, what's important for Vermont. And then also, you know, if there is, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit if you, about some, some racial disparities trends as well, because, you know, what we're likely to see is more A-Ride trained officers, more um, pot potential highway enforcement um, and what that could mean. So um, I know you shared some slides with me. If, um, Nelly, I think, uh, is going to manage that on your behalf, um, but uh, if you, I'd turn things over to you. Okay, thank you. And um, so I do apologize that I can't do video, um, but that means I can't see who's in the room. And do you mind introducing yourself? I know Pepper's voice, but I don't know anyone else's voice. Uh, this is Julie Hilbert, another board member. And Kyle Harris, another board Thank member. You. And we have uh, Nellie Marvel is our um, uh, program technician, and we have Orca Media here as well. And, and Bryn Hare is kind of coming in and out a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. So on um, slide two, who we are. Um, so we serve as what's called the State Statistical Analysis Center under a contract with Department of Public Safety. Every state has somebody like us. Um, we are the only one that is a nonprofit outside of state government. Sometimes they are at universities, but mostly they are within the Department of Public Safety or some um, executive branch office. Um, what we do and what our job is, is uh, to provide um, information to people. So um, we have on our um, computers about 30 years of court data, all filings and dispositions for criminal court, juvenile court, judicial bureau, and civil suspensions. And so some of the things that I do, for example, is I sit in the sentencing commission and somebody wants to know, what's the sentence for burglary? And I just look it up on my computer and I tell you. Um, we also are collecting, um, so NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting Data, um, that's submitted by law enforcement agencies to DPS. Um, we get that uh, submission and are able to answer questions about crime that is reported under that system. Uh, and that includes, so you know, um, how much of a drug quantity was found at a, at a, a, um, uh, in a crime. 
um, whether or not they suspected the offender of using a, a particular drug or alcohol during the commission of an offense. So it's a very rich, detailed data set that we have and we can continue to uh, use um, as you go forward, especially with um, the commercialization. On a project needed basis, we have access to Vermont criminal history data, and this um, is the rap sheet of a person, and we use this to come up with two things. Uh, we look at recidivism rates for programs. So we have, for example, evaluated the um, DUI courts down in um, Windsor and the drug courts and the mental health courts uh, to see you know, what the recidivism rate is for those participants versus you know, control groups that we try to create um, who didn't have the benefit of those programs. Um, we also use it to come up with a typology of offenders. So right now I have a project where I'm working on um, people uh, who were charged under our vulnerable adult statute, so people who abuse vulnerable adults, and uh, looking to see how their criminal past is different than a control group, and it's much different. Um, so this gives insight into how people offend and, and what policies we might put into place to, um, uh, you know, work with that population. The Department of Corrections has on um, the state website a public use file, and this is everyone who is under control of the Department of Corrections from 2015 forward. Um, and this is a great uh, data source. We can track people across the systems to find out, you know, what was their original charge in the court data, um, how much time did they spend on pretrial detention, uh, how much time did they spend on probation, um, et cetera. And then we also um, often work with um, emergency department and hospital discharge data, and these are also public data. Um, that are posted on the Department of Health website, and this includes the IDC-10 codes, um, and that's the billing uh, that people, that the billing agencies, you know, put into your insurance companies. This is helpful um, and may be helpful going forward. Colorado used these data sets, um, especially in relationship to emergency room um, discharges uh, surrounding edibles. And I understand that we're not going that way, but to think about what you might want to see. Um, and I can say from working with human trafficking and with domestic violence, that if there's an IDC-10 code that you are interested in, in um, following um, these years, that a training program of some sort for the ED folks um, so that they know when that should be used and how it should be used so that we can accurately track those, those um, emergency discharge data. We also provide technical assistance like this or helping people create databases or uh, assistance to various legislative boards um, where uh, you know, we just use our expertise in the, in the field of criminal justice data in Vermont and try to um, you know, help people make uh, informed decisions. And we also act as research partners for agencies and organizations. So I mentioned, for example, we're the research partner for Human Trafficking Task Force. We're a research partner for Lund's um, Family Services, where we're looking at a substance use program that they're, uh, you know, um, delivering to families who are at risk of losing their kids to DCF, and we're evaluating whether this is a better option than business as usual. So um, that's quite a lot of what we do. And then, so I'll just stop there for now since that was a lot and ask if there's any questions. Any questions, Robin? Robin, I know the NIVERS data and the DOC data um, can be delineated by certain kind of characteristics of the, of the person. Uh, is that true of some of the other data points that you get? Yeah, so the court data includes the race and uh, age of the defendant, or the date of birth, so I calculate the age of the defendant, um, and now begins to include uh, the gender. It didn't in the past, um, but I can get that through other sources. You know, I can, I can cross I can cross reference. I think one thing after listening to the sergeant's presentation and to Mandy's presentation, I want to just kind of put a footnote somewhere. The police incident number is the thing that I need to track people, and this sounds awful, but to track, this, to track that case across the system. So if the sergeant as a DRE expert makes a stop and says that it's, um, you know, they suspected a pot, you know, there, there's the police incident number. That police incident number I can track into the court data and tell you what happened to that case. 
um, because as you know, our courts, our, our, um, our uh, statutes don't distinguish right very well between whether somebody was, you know, just on, under the generic driving while impaired, um, DUI drugs, but what what type of drug? Um, so because we don't have that clarity in the statutes for research purposes, we have to have those incident numbers to track back. So one thing I kind of am recommending um, is that if you want that sort of tracking, that we begin the process of finding out that data flow information now. Um, so especially we can, you know, test that, that data sharing out. Um, but that incident number can, can track us all around. Um, and from the incident number, I get the docket number. The docket number I can track into DOC or into the criminal histories um, and get all sorts of information that way as well. Yeah. Thanks for the footnote. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So on slide three, types of data and sources, um, so, so the data that I just talked about is largely administrative data. And this is created, uh, collected, and captured by administrative units for the purpose of carrying out their mission. And that's really important um, because sometimes we want to use their data for other things, but they're not collecting it for that purpose. They're collecting the data to carry out the mission of the agency. Um, and it's just something that we have to be aware of when we're working with the data. And when we say, can't you collect more data, um, that may not be within the mission of their agency, or you may not want that particular agency collecting that data. You may want it you know, to come from somewhere else. Um, so administrative data is what we largely use um, and what is available. Um, qualitative data is observation, interviews, focus, focus groups, and sometimes surveys. And then other quantitative data can include surveys um, and observations of quanti quanti yeah, quantifiable events. So the date and time. Um, Mandy talked about vehicle miles traveled, uh, the season, right? So these are things that I know affect, for example, uh, you know, crashes, right? So we have different types of crashes in the winter time, um, at night. Um, so those are things that, you know, just are objective quantifiable data that we don't need to rely on an administrative data source to, um, to get. So slide four, when to use administrative data. Um, so again, administrative data is, mess, is best to measure the business of the agency because that's what they're collecting it for. How many times did you provide programming um, in, the, in, you know, in the Northwest Correctional Facility for this? Um, I want to talk about crime rates and data. Um, so an increase in crime rates in the data may not actually indicate an increase in crime. Um, we, have, we did an audit of the law enforcement data and you can see uh, that's on our website, but I'll just tell you that one of the things is data quality, right? So a switch in how an officer um, learns to code something can change the crime rate. There was some problems in, in you know, the early part of uh, 2014 um, with a computer system not speaking correctly to the FBI, and it looks like, our, like we solved domestic violence. We had no domestic violence that year, uh, which wasn't true. It just, it just was a computer error. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, there could be workflow issues. So the, the court data this year is obviously going to be much lower in volume than it has been in particular years. And that's because of COVID, it has nothing to do with um, the crime itself, right? Or what happened. And then uh, one thing that um, is always interesting to me when it comes to um, police data, an increase of crime that's reported uh, to police may be a result of a, an agency actually building trust within a particular community. Um, so, for example, I have a study right now that's looking at rural and, rur um, rural and urban injuries in domestic violence cases. And I have one urban domestic one urban agency whose uh, domestic violence is very, very uh, injurious. So they have very serious injuries. And it's not because that city is more violent. It's because the police are filling out a particular form that's looking like they have more violence. So they're, they've built up this relationship with the community 
um, to really go to make sure they're capturing the data for the state's attorney. So it's not that they are necessarily more violent, they're just documenting it better. And then on the next slide, I'll show you some policy changes and how that affects data. So these are misdemeanor charges disposed from 2010 to 2019. And I've highlighted um, you know, the big policy changes. So if you look in the category of drugs from 2013 and before, right, so we're, we're you know, about 1,800 cases, uh, charges, sorry, a year are being disposed, and then we decriminalize pot, and it drops. So crime went down because we made, we, we made a crime go away. Um, likewise, if you look over down at weapons, the asterisk means that there's less than five. Um, so for a long time, very few weapons charges, and then in 2016, our weapons charges start increasing. And that's because we invented a new crime. So carefully looking at what's causing these uh, numbers to increase. Um, so it's not that we necessarily have more weapons um, involved in our uh, in our crimes, it's that we made a new crime about it, and this increases our rates. So I'll just stop there and ask if there are any questions. Any questions about this this slide or the? I I do have a question. Maybe you're going to get to it about qualitative data. Yep. Um, Next slide. Was, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll wait. I'll hold on that. All right. Uh, so the next slide is when to use qualitative data. And um, qualitative data is when you want to hear from a particular group about their experiences or perceptions. So once everything gets up and running, you might want to hear about growers' experiences in the licensing um, uh, going through that bureaucracy. Or how do retail workers experience um, their personal safety while working um, in the retail shops for cannabis? Um, very small population of people that you're interested in their perceptions and modifying public policy because of that. Um, they're not captured in the administrative data. So a lot of the administrative data, again, it's capturing the business of the agency. It's not capturing how we necessarily interact as citizens with that agency. So um, when you want policy solutions that won't be available in the administrative data, and I'm going to give you two examples. For those of you that have been to the Barry Courthouse, um, there's a bus stop in front of that Barry Courthouse. And when I interviewed victims of domestic violence, um, that bus stop is an inhibiting factor for them seeking relief in the courthouse because their abusers can sit in that, in that bus stop legally. So they have to, there's no way to get into the courthouse without passing that bus stop. Um, and that's not something you would get out of administrative data. They would like the bus stop moves. There are people working on moving that bus stop. Um, another, um, you know, policy issue came again with domestic violence. And um, in Bennington County, they piloted an RFA relief from abuse order. Um, uh, procedure where they staggered the arrival, uh, so there was no bus stop issue. They, stag they staggered the arrival of um, the, the defendants and the victims and then placed them in separate rooms until the, the time of the hearing. And this was to make victims feel safer, but that's like a how do I measure whether victims feel safer? Uh, I had an attorney who worked in both Bennington and Rutland, and when I was interviewing him, he said, Yes, victims feel safer in Bennington. And I know this because they don't ask me if it's safe to go to the bathroom. In Rutland, they ask me if it's safe to go to the bathroom because they're afraid that he's going to find them on the way to the bathroom. And, and they didn't have that fear in, in Bennington. So again, things that aren't captured by administrative data are never going to show up in any statistical analysis, um, but are really powerful, concrete policy suggestions that, that people can empower, can, you know, can in, then implement to make the experience safer for victims, in that case of domestic violence. Um, and that's also because, you know, for a lot of, you know, there's going to be little empirical data for a lot of your topics, especially here. Um, I'm going to say that it's going to be about five years after the first door opens for you to have a decent number for quantitative analysis, and you don't want to wait that long to get feedback. And it's also to ensure that the stories of the underrepresented are analyzed with the same rigor as the quantitative data. And I'll just go to the next slide to show you from the criminal courts. 
two things. So this is dispositions um, of unique dockets by county, by race. And if you look at the highlighted um, portions, what I was highlighting here um, was, was mostly just to, it was, this was for another presentation, but what I wanna draw your attention to here is how few, for example, indigenous uh, defendants went through the system in five years. Um, and so in any statistical analysis, you can control for this. You can, you know, there's certain things when, you're, when you're, isn't, um, your distribution isn't normal, et cetera. But a lot of times it just gets, it gets you know, overrun. Um, or the experience in Chittenden County overruns everyone else's experience. And here's where, um, you know, spending time talking to people as they experience the system um, in a rigorous manner gives, them, gives that experience an equal weight as the statistical experience um, that the, the predominant um, population gets to have. And then on the next slide, you'll see this gets to some of the disparity so, and why sometimes the math you really want to augment the math if, you know, with the um, qualitative. So this was sentence distributions, again, for those same five years. And Chittenden County sentenced no white defendants to incarcerations for 2.5 grams or more, um, and 12 charges for black defendants. So that's a disparity that needs to be further examined, but because of the small numbers, a more qualitative analysis, and that could be looking at case files um, you know, talking to people about why these decisions were made and about that. Um, and Wyndham County, um, uh, Chittenden and Wyndham both sentenced nine charges of black defendants to incarceration. Um, and you also still here have really small numbers uh, where this is again over five years. So um, if, if you want a more... Um, recent picture than talking to people is um, what you really want to do. And if you go to the next slide, I'll just talk a little bit about the difference between qualitative analysis and testimony. Um, because we do hear from people a lot in testimony. Uh, and testimony to public bodies is different. It's not, for one, not focused on the witness rights, um, comfort, or harm reduction. Uh, it's a very public. It has to be. That's, that's right. That's the law. Um, it's often limited in time. Uh, activists can provide canned speeches, which, which remove nuance, and that's the point, right? So we march everybody in there, say these words, and the legislature or whatever public body hears this is what we're saying. Um, and there's rarely a systematic analysis of these stories or an analysis of whose stories are missing. Um, and you compare that to actual qualitative research. Uh, first of all, this is overseen by an ethics panel to protect participants. Um, so we are in, in the process of interviewing victims of sex trafficking. And so in order to protect them, you know, we have, uh, we, we, you know, planned out to have space um, in a network, um, the domestic violence network, um, in one of their satellite offices, you know, so a, a safe space that's already secure. We have on standby um, their case managers, if they want to take a break and, and talk, if they're, if they're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, right? So we create this atmosphere recognizing that we are talking to people with trauma and how do we, we don't want their conversation with us to add to that trauma. Um, they're analyzed for themes by multiple trained researchers, often using computer software. Um, and this is designed to check our, our biases about what we're, how we're coding things to make sure that we are coding things across um, researchers in the same way. We have more freedom to recruit participants. We pay them. Um, and again, so we have protection on um, trauma and confidentiality. And so I'll stop there and ask about qualitative research questions. Um, Robin, how... Uh what are the best practices about doing this qualitative research other than what you just said? I mean, should we be thinking of specific questions that we want answered um, and then uh, designing a qualitative research program around that? I mean, I, you know. Yeah, that's, that's usually what we do. Well, so, so it, well, it depends. Sometimes like with the uh, survivors of sex trafficking, 
we want to know about their experience. So we started with the population and then started with what questions do we want to ask from them. Um, and also by centering the conversation around the population, um, you're centering the conversation around their needs um, instead of saying these are my needs and what can I get from who, right? And so this allows it to be a, a, um, a little bit, it centers the protection of the victim, which is what we're, or, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, and even if it's not a person who's a victim of a crime, um, my profession as a researcher, I'm sure most of you know, has not always been kind to participants in research studies. Uh, so that's why we, we, we focus on the comfort of the participants um, and what, and to let their stories kind of, you know, drive um, the questions in some ways. Does that make sense? It does. And, um, you know, we have about, looks like 20 or so, 25 participants today. These are folks that, you know, have expressed an interest. They found us. Um, but how do we overcome any sort of kind of selection bias in, in developing our qualitative research? You know, how do we make sure that we're actually hearing from the folks that might not trust the government, for instance, might not uh, want to come forward with their stories, might not know that we want this, we want to hear from them? Yep. So, well, we, what we look at is um, ways to ad, well, actually advertise, um, and any advertising materials are approved by an ethics board. Um, and sometimes we use snowball sampling, right? Which is just, you know, um, the old. I'm going to really date myself. The old Brett commercial. I told a friend, and you told a friend, and and, and they told a friend. Um, to to gather participants, we make it. You know, we have been fortunate enough to um, have been put into um, the short list for uh, an earmark, and we are working with the NAACP's down in Wyndham County and Curtis's group um, to begin to identify, if we're lucky, to go forward with the study. This will be a qualitative study of defendants of color in the southern part of the state. Um, you know, to talk about their experiences in the criminal justice system. So sometimes it is reaching out to the advocacy organizations, um, but sometimes it's also reaching out to the defenders um, and making sure that we can protect um, protect uh, the participants from subpoenas, from, um, you know, anything that might happen, um, uh, you know, hearsay statements, et cetera. Um, you know, so again, focus on the protection, but also um, trying to work with folks to make sure we're getting the widest amount of, of possible people. And then when you're doing your analysis, you recognize who was excluded. And that's just as important as recognizing who was included. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, and next slide, please. So the next slide should be a note on surveys. Um, and this actually gets to a little bit what Pepper was saying. Um, sampling is an issue in Vermont, and I'm just going to put out there that if anyone's listening that has a say in this, the Castleton Polling Institute was a really great resource for Vermont, and it went away. Um, so for the Cannabis Board, what I, would, what I recommend is explore buying questions on surveys where statisticians have already done the math. And um, I used to, years ago, buy a question on the, uh, the behavioral risk survey um, that went out to Vermont, done by the Department of Health, and it was about your fear of being caught D, uh, for driving with DUI, right? So one of the things about, um, you know, um, deterrence is that I have to believe that I'm going to get caught in order to be deterred. Uh, and so we were interested over the years, and this was many, many years ago, of you know what did how many Vermonters thought that they were actually going to get pulled over for DUI. I don't know if buying those questions is still an option, but it's something to look into, um, and it is a way to like just kind of you know glom on to somebody else's hard work, um, and then you just want to pay for a question or two on those surveys. Um, if you're going to do your own surveys, um, have a survey designed or looked over by a professional researcher um, for inconsistencies, privacy, et cetera. Uh, sometimes, you know, surveys seem like this easy thing to do, but if you change the scale um, from one 
you know, question to another, your answers aren't going to be valid. And the next slide. Um, so Colorado's research experience, and I've linked here to their report. This is my counterpart in Colorado. And um, every time she sees me at a, at a conference, she's like, you want to talk about pot again, don't you? I was like, yeah, I do. I want to know what you're doing. Um, they have been um, obviously one of the states ahead of the curve here and um, have been working on collecting data. And you guys don't have a mandate, thankfully, so far, uh, to collect particular types of data um, from the legislature. But, you know, we should think about what, um, what metrics you want to use. Um, the legislature mandated, and this is a problem, that didn't ex they mandated data that didn't exist or have no meaning. Uh, so, for example, they mandated... Marijuana initiated context by law enforcement broken down by judicial district and race and ethnicity. And their response was, this isn't a term used by any law enforcement agency, nor is it, nor is contact data for any purpose actually collected systemically by law enforcement agencies. Um, they also didn't, you know, say how somebody was to determine a, a person's race, whether it was going to be self-reported or going to be officer perceived. Um, so they just can't answer that. Um, so working with, um, working with folks to make sure that we um, agree on definitions and what people want is uh, important. Uh, and the next slide. On, they were also mandated to collect information that wasn't defined or centrally collected. So crime near a marijuana retail establishment. Um, so they didn't define near. Um, and how do the police, these are questions you want to ask, how do the police capture that call in their data system? Can the system extract that information? And I'll just say if this is something you want to do, you're going to need a committee to decide and agree on this and then an agreement to revisit this because somebody's going to put a, put a store where you didn't think they were going to and now we have to redefine what near is. Um, so my point here is, is you know, that is that it's, a, it's an ongoing process, data collection and data management. Um, somebody's always going to do something. You're like, oh, didn't think that that was going to happen, and here we are. Um, and so approaching this thoughtfully and with stakeholders, community members, et cetera, involved is the way to get a meaningful report that can um, measure what you want to measure over the years. Other information that was difficult for DUI in their court data, like ours, they don't distinguish the type of drug. Um, there was no central repository for postal crime, so that was pot sent through the mail. And a lot of probation data were not available, and that's going to be the same here. And then as I was thinking about this, on the next slide, what about your data? And approach that your data systems as a cannabis control board and data collection about your activity with an eye about equity and transparency and mapping to other systems. And to make sure that when you design your forms and databases um, that you're doing this with, for future evaluation. Uh, this, the government, the, the legislature has put results-based accountability, which is a trademarked name, um, in statute, so you're going to have to answer those questions when you go right before the, the, the legislature. Any type of equity analysis you want to do and other appropriate necessary evaluative measures, um, you should also be actively thinking about as a board how you are going to collect your own data. And then finally, what can we do? Um, this is the last slide. Um, Proof of concept. So in 2017, I was teaching a class on crime analysis and crime mapping, and I actually took the earlier Colorado report, and my students and I went through and identified all, the, all their data sources, and can we replicate this here in Vermont? And we can, for the most part. Um, we have access to all the same data. A lot of it is national mandated data. Um, and so you have that report. Um, not all of those things will be relevant for Vermont because of our rural nature, but happy to sit down and, and go through that and say, this is easy to do, this requires more work, um, and this is ways, you know, like I was talking about, you know, taking that incident number across the, 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 um, the system. Um, these are ways we can improve in that data collection. Uh, form, uh, you know, plan for qualitative research by identifying questions, funding sources, and researchers. Um, and I, 
I was also thinking that you might also consider a process evaluation at some point of your process. So a process evaluation is what's considered action research by the feds now. And that's actually a year or two into your process. Um, a researcher comes in, I, you know, interviews you about the process, documents things. Um, this is useful as a, as a living history document for you. It's useful for other states who are going to go through this, like, hey, these were the problems, these were the things that worked, these were the Vermont quirky things. Um, former stakeholders group, oh, I still spell practitioners wrong. Um, former stakeholders group um, for data metrics. And you want to include early on the tech folks from, from the Agency of Digital Services or wherever, practitioners, researchers, community members absolutely have to be at the table. Um, and then what do you want to measure? Can we? What will it cost? And then finally, be flexible, creative, and start now. Um, now is the time to really put the effort into deciding how we're going to measure and what we're um, going to do. And so that is my presentation. Thank you for that. That is obviously um, eye-opening for us about, you know, maybe it's something that was a blind spot in the legislation, honestly. Um, I know Massachusetts, for instance, has built in, I think similarly to Colorado, a department underneath their Cannabis Control Commission to collect and report data, a whole kind of sub-department. Um, so, uh, I don't think we're, we're going to be able to pull that off anytime soon, but um, any questions for Robin? I just, I think the first um, takeaway that I have from this, Robin, and, and tell me if I've, I've kind of summarized this in my head correctly, is that we really need to find out what kind of data is being collected statewide now. And, you know, where that is, I mean, that seems like a really big project, but like, <laughs> We need to find out what kind no, no, of data not. is in my out head. there. Right. It's in my head. Um, <laughs> right, I can come out and add and tell Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Um, so, and, and we, you know, there are lots of organizations, there are lots of initiatives right now that are mapping that. So, um, Pepper said RDAP. Um, you know, so we've mapped out, and I can send you, like, you know, what I sent to them as far as who's collecting what data and what's missing. Um, the National Criminal Justice Reform Project, which Pepper was also on. They're working on a data integration initiative. Um, so it's not as overwhelming um, as it may seem, as far as what data are being collected and who has it. Great. I promise. Thank you. <laughs> well, can I, can I ask you about that a little bit too, Robin? Because yeah. um, what, I've, what I've noticed over the past few years is that kind of the data collection and analysis, it's kind of an iterative process. You know, we had that report from I don't know, 2015, maybe 2016, that showed these racial disparities in the incarcerated population. And that led to the question mm -hmm. of, well, why is that happening? Which led to, you know, more data collection and more analysis, more identifying gaps. And then, you know, to me, that process ultimately um, led to kind of the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics proposal. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if we're even qualified. I think, you know, you mentioned you had some good tips for us to even know what questions to ask in order to um, get the data, to collect the data that we need to kind of um, present to someone? And should we be partnering potentially with the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics if that is to take shape um, as our kind of primary collection or repository and analysis center? Well, I think that um, that is, probably farther away than actually the first opening of a retail cannabis store. That's just my yeah. own kind of, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, on the executive side and the agency of digital services of stuff that needs to happen before you get to the point that even part of the data that the, that they want is, is available. Um, and so I don't know um, the answer. I just don't know that it's going to be a viable answer by the time you want some answers. I think, for your research questions, um, I think your community members, uh, I think you know the public have a lot of research questions that they want answered. Uh, and so starting with their questions um, until you're able to see some policy questions uh, arise on your own, um, or that you hear enough from people going through the process to say this is a question that I keep hearing and I'm trying to you know think of an example of 
you know, um, I live um, in Barry Town. We've just recently gone through a reappraisal. Um, so my representatives are hearing quite a lot from residents about, well, what is this and how can it happen now and why is it fair? So it's fair to say that, you know, the co very complicated reappraisal process that Burlington and Barry Town have just gone through, nobody really understands it. Um, and that they feel kind of blindsided by it. So that's, a, right, that's the question because this policy happened and now everyone is kind of in shock. Um, so that's what I mean, like you have to wait for something to happen sometimes. Yeah. Um, but, you're, you know, working with your community stakeholders and your others in your uh, advisory board to come up with questions that they think they might want to know the answers to someday. Um, is a good, you know, is a good, is a good place to start. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Well, um, Robin, I know it was kind of short notice. I'm so thankful uh, that you were able to come and join us and and help us kind of think through these initial questions and, and really get us prepared for when these uh, retail shops are open and, and the kind of making sure we're keeping track of of uh, the important aspects of it so, so thank you for joining us and I know we'll be in touch um, are you all right with us posting your slides is that okay on our website that's fine okay yep great well thanks so much great yep sure bye-bye bye so um, next on our agenda is a uh, public comment period um, we're gonna start with the folks who join via the link um, and if you have a public comment, you can raise your virtual hand. We'll then move to the folks on the phone. Um, so anyone with a public comment or anything that you'd like to share with the board, please feel free to raise your virtual hand. All right. And if anyone on the phone would like to give a public comment, um, you can Unmute yourself uh, by hitting star six. All right, well, we'll take a quick um, lunch break. Uh, we'll be back at 12.30 and we're gonna shift our focus more to um, some of the banking concerns and, and safe banking issues uh, in the cannabis industry. Um, this is the cannabis board. Uh, it's uh, about 12:30 right now. We're going to shift focus today. Our, our kind of overarching theme was uh, public safety, and we heard a lot about highway safety this morning. We're going to turn to safe banking, um, and we have the commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation, who's here to give us a COVID update. Uh, just kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, no. Um, Commissioner Pichek, thank you for joining us. Um, I know you're on a short timeline. Uh, you're in the middle of about six different things right now. So I was wondering, you know, I worked uh, previously with your, um, with the former commissioner, uh, Commissioner Donegan, on some banking and insurance issues. And I'd like to hear just kind of, I, I know your office was heavily involved in the Governor Scott's Marijuana Advisory Commission Tax and Regulate Subcommittee and just like to hear kind of an update from DFR on how banking is progressing in this area and some issues and concerns that we should be thinking about. Um, and uh, we're gonna be hearing from VSCCU after you, um, and then we're gonna be hearing kind of a federal update uh, on what the legislation that um, kind of the House and the Senate are, are looking at. So I'll turn things over to you, but thanks again for being here. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. If it if it's if it works for you and you you're able to see it, I had a, just a few PowerPoint slides that I think might help. Um, you know, just sort of lay the framework of, about the sort of dual regulatory structure that exists in banking and what and you know why there's some of these challenges, and then sort of how are banks um, how are banks sort of addressing the risks that exist? How are they minimizing them? And then how are we working with banks to you know, and credit unions to, to help them, uh, you know, minimize their risk as well. So, so maybe I'll just, I'll just share that. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think if you, you probably have permission right now, but let us know if you don't. I think I, I think I am good here. So. There you go. We see that. Excellent. 
<laughs> so just, you know, again, very broad background, but I think for the, the members of the board, it might be might be useful just to, to level set here. So, um, you know, there are banks and, and, and credit unions. They're the primary sort of, uh, you know, entities that are in the, uh, you know, the sort of banking financial services space. Uh, they um, are a little bit different, uh, you know, creatures in terms of their organizational structure, their tax treatment, you know, traditionally, who their um, who their populations are that they're banking, what kind of services they can provide. A uh, bank is uh, generally thought of as you know a, a more robust organization that can you know provide a whole array of financial services to individuals, to banks, to uh, sorry to uh, corporations, to other uh, you know entities. A credit union generally uh, serving a little bit different population, uh, generally more individual members, less uh, member banking, although they can do small business uh, banking and the like. Um, but ultimately, you know, they need to get a charter uh, in order to organize and, and do their work. And uh, both banks uh, and credit unions can get either a state or a federal charter. Um, if they are getting a state charter, those are um, issued by departments like the DFR in Vermont, but other uh, state uh, regulators across the country. So there are 50, 51 uh, including DC, 51 entities like DFR. Uh, they're all a little bit different, but uh, you know, that will issue a, a bank, uh, state bank or a state credit union charter. Um, and then there are federal charters that have uh, developed over time as well. Uh, there's not a single federal entity uh, like there might be at the state, uh, but the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency would provide a federal charter for a bank, a national bank. Um, and the National Credit Union uh, Association, the NCUA, uh, would provide a federal charter to a federal credit union. So just again, for example, in Vermont, we have all of these four different types of entities, if you will, operating in the state. Um, we have you know, the National Bank of Orwell, the National Bank of Middlebury, uh, that uh, are national banks under the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. We have larger um, regional banks like People's United Bank or TD Bank that would similarly be under the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Um, we have federally chartered Credit unions like uh, uh, the uh, New England Federal Credit Union, uh, Vermont Federal Credit Union, uh, and then we have state chartered banks like Union Bank, uh, Northfield Savings Bank, uh, state chartered credit unions uh, like the Vermont State Employees Credit Union. So they are a state chartered uh, Vermont bank. Um, so there are all these different sort of structures that a bank can take or different regulators that they can have, but ultimately uh, they all do uh, flow up uh, to a couple of different federal entities. One is on the deposit insurer side and the other is on the central banking side. Uh, but just taking the deposit insurer side for a second. So both banks and credit unions are required uh, to provide uh, some level of assurance insurance uh, to their customers, to their members, that the deposits that they have at those institutions uh, will be protected even if uh, the bank um, you know, fails and, uh, and, and, there's a, and there's an issue with the bank or the credit union. Uh, so um, ever since the uh, 1930s, that has existed uh, in the United States for banks with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. Uh, so the FDIC will insure both state and federal chartered banks. Uh, they are all members of the FDIC, and they will insure deposits for individual uh, depositors up to $250,000. So if you have $50,000 at a bank, whether it's People's United Bank or, um, you know, or, or, Union, uh, or, or Union Bank here in Vermont, uh, and something catastrophic financially happens to that bank, uh, and the FDIC has to take over uh, the organization, uh, you have protection under this system uh, up to $250,000 for what you have on deposit. Uh, same thing with the credit unions, although it's a different organization. The National Credit Union Association is both the entity that gives the charter to credit unions, but it's also the entity that provides um, the deposit uh, insurance as well. So uh, again, this is even if you're a state chartered bank, uh, this is a, a situation where you uh, run into a federal entity because you are required to cover uh, carry this kind of a deposit insurance. Uh, so if you're a bank, you'd be a member of the FDIC. If you're a state chartered credit union, you'd be a member of the National uh, Credit Union uh, Associations, the NCU, the NCUA. Uh, and then similarly, uh, when it comes to the central banking system that we have um, here in the uh, in the United States, the Federal Reserve plays a number of different roles. It controls monetary policy in the United States. 
Uh, it is itself a regulator of bank holding companies. Uh, it also provides um, financial services to banks themselves, banks and credit unions. So uh, some banks like federal chartered banks are, are members of the Federal Reserve. They might hold stock in the Federal Reserve. Uh, state chartered banks, if they meet certain standards, can also be members of the Federal Reserve, but that's an optional membership. But across the board, whether it's a federal chartered credit union uh, or a state chartered credit union or a state chartered bank, uh, they all rely on the Federal Reserve for um, this sort of interstate banking, this ability to um, have a check that was uh, written from a bank in California, being able to deposit that in Vermont uh, and have those funds sort of end up in the right place. Uh, when you look at your checking account and there's sort of that nine digit number uh, that goes before your banking account, um, that nine digit number is the the, the master account that your um, financial institution has with the Federal Reserve. So it's able to account for all of those different transactions that are happening across the country and sort of play, you know, play uh, air traffic control, if you will, and make sure that the deposits and the and the uh, withdrawals and, and the transactions are all landing uh, in the right place. So it's another critical component to um, the the interstate banking system. It's another critical component to our state chartered banks, even though they are primarily regulated by the Department of Financial Regulation, the Federal Reserve plays a really key role. Uh, so I think, you know, that's sort of the framework of the regulatory system. And I just really wanted to try to get across the point that even a state chartered bank here in Vermont um, is really dependent on these federal regulators, whether it is the FDIC, the NCUA, um, or the uh, Federal Reserve as well. So although they need to be mindful of the um, regulatory uh, approach that we have at the department and the statutes and regulations that are in force here in Vermont, they also need to be um, cognizant and, and conform with the uh, federal statutes, the federal regulations, um, and the federal approaches that these uh, regulators um, take uh, outside of Vermont's jurisdiction also. So, you know, if a bank is a bank or a credit union, you know, is deciding to um, enter the, the space and bank cannabis related businesses or uh, marijuana related businesses um, in particular, you know, they 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 really can think about what are the most dramatic things that could happen to our organization? What are the worst case scenarios that could happen since uh, marijuana is still uh, classified as a schedule one drug and um, and, uh, you know, has criminal liability that attaches to that for those that transact in, in, in sale of it. You know, a bank or a credit union could potentially face um, criminal liability for banking a business engaging, you know, in what is this federally uh, illegal activity. Um, now, this is very unlikely, but it is sort of the worst case scenario that a bank or a credit union would think through before uh, deciding whether to operate in this space. Um, a regulator could pull the bank's uh, or credit union's charter. So uh, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the NCUA, could pull a um, an entity's charter, which basically would, would end that institution. It would have to merge with another institution or go into uh, basically liquidation. Um, the FDIC, the NCUA, could terminate the bank's uh, or credit union's membership. It could terminate their ability to get deposit insurance. Uh, so that would also put those organizations in a really tight spot. Uh, if you were a bank, you probably would need to merge with another bank or liquidate. Um, if you're a credit union, uh, there are some private options available for that deposit insurance, but they're not necessarily widely available. It would really put the institution in a tight spot. Um, they could lose access to the Federal Reserve Master Account, which again would pretty much be um, fatal, if not close to fatal, for an organization that relies on the interbank, inter interstate banking system. Um, and then, of course, there's the possibility that an individual, um, you know, member of the bank or an individual customer of the bank could also be prosecuted um, and funds that are held at the bank uh, could end up in a um, forfeiture proceeding that could be uh, both labor intensive and time consuming for the bank and could have uh, negative impacts on uh, the bank's or credit union's balance sheet as well. So these are risks that are put in the category of negligible. They're not they're not things that you would expect to happen, but they're also not in the category of zero risk. You know, there's no indication that the federal government is planning to prioritize, uh, you know, um, banks or financial institutions that engage in uh, in uh, marijuana related businesses for criminal activity. There's no indication that federal regulators are planning to um, pull charters or end memberships. 
certainly here at the Department of Financial Regulation, we are uh, doing everything we can to work with our state chartered banks and credit unions to help them develop a compliance system uh, that works and that uh, will be uh, compliant with the federal guidance that's been laid out. Uh, so we certainly are not in a position, uh, would never be in a position, I would say, to, to take such action. But but the the risk is not zero, and that and that's the kind of thing that banks and credit unions think about. Um, what's the risk? What's the reward uh, when getting uh, into this new uh, industry? There's some other sort of considerations that are beyond those worst case scenarios that a bank or a credit union you know would think about as well. And certainly, um, Vermont State Employees Credit Union can go into more detail here. But uh, in order to to sort of make sure they have a compliance program that is not going to make them run afoul of state or federal uh, guidelines. You know, there's certainly a lot of compliance costs that go into that in terms of uh, doing due diligence on your uh, customers on the upfront part of the relationship. So when you're onboarding them as a customer and then also ongoing um, uh, focus on those customers as well to, again, make sure that they're complying with the guidance that has been issued in this space. Uh, legal costs certainly uh, are a result of that as well as uh, banks and credit unions think about what's the liability if they do face any, uh, you know, any actions from uh, from uh, from uh, state or federal regulators, certainly something that uh, would drive up legal costs, educational costs of the bank and the credit union themselves of not the not the legal or the compliance issues, but just the industry itself. How does the industry work? Um, how do you um, effectively provide services to the industry? You know, not all institutions are um, as familiar with the with the industry and would have considerable internal education that they would need to do to enter the space. So it's just another consideration for a financial uh, organization. Uh, logistical costs, you know, what does this mean? If, it, if it's a highly cash industry, what does it mean um, for that bank? Do they need to have more armed guards? Do they need to have more armored vehicles? Do they need to have more space to store uh, you know, high amounts of cash that maybe they don't see regularly? So there's some logistical costs. And then, you know, every credit union and bank will tell you there's also reputational costs or reputational considerations, I would say. You know, not every member of a credit union or every customer of a bank would be happy uh, with a bank or credit union um, providing banking services in this space. Uh, so it's just something that a bank or a credit union has to think about. So these, uh, you know, are not the... Um, the worst case scenarios that are that are not likely to happen but do exist. These are more of the you know everyday considerations that a financial institution would have to think through uh, before making an affirmative decision that they wanted to enter the industry and provide uh, financial services to the industry. Um, in terms of that compliance piece, you know I think this is this is probably just probably the most helpful slide uh, for folks to get a sense of you know what. Um, you know, what needs to happen uh, for a bank or credit union when they decide to accept deposits or, or customers um, from the cannabis industry or the marijuana industry. So everyone's familiar with the, with the coal memorandum uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the fact that it was uh, promulgated uh, originally in 2013, repromulgated in 14, um, even though it was rescinded. Uh, the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is the entity that provided uh, guidance in this space it still refers to the coal memorandum. Uh, the guidance that our department uh, uh, issues and works with banks and credit unions on if they're interested in working in this space still refers to the coal memorandum. Uh, the federal government hasn't really expressed a an alternative uh, viewpoint on its prosecutorial discretion. So everyone, as you know, sort of continues to um, uh, operate in this space as if the coal memorandum is the is the defining, um, you know, federal guidance uh, to consider. So the Bank Secrecy Act is a federal uh, act that um, is really focused on um, criminal activity, anti-money laundering activity, uh, trying to get at criminal organizations. It requires banks um, and credit unions to have a sense of who their customers are, what type of activities they're involved with. When they think, when they see things that are suspicious, it requires them to issue the SARS, the Suspicious Activity Report. So that Bank Secrecy Act really is um, a driving a compliance um, framework, uh, even outside of cannabis, marijuana. It's a, it's a framework that uh, is critical for banks and credit unions to understand and to comply with. Um, so when the Cole Memo was reissued back in, in 2014, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, 
they issued guidance on the same day about how a bank or a credit union that's working with customers can um, avoid uh, the pitfalls, can avoid the priorities that were identified under the Cole Memorandum in terms of um, areas where the Department of Justice might actually be interested in uh, bringing prosecution. So uh, basically, they require financial institutions to do due diligence on their customers, um, do due diligence on their operations. Um, if they believe that a customer of theirs is, uh, you know, they know a customer of theirs is in uh, a marijuana-related business and that they're taking uh, deposits or, or transactions from that business, uh, they know that, but they also know through their own due diligence that they are uh, are complying with the Cole Memorandum, that all their activities uh, within that uh, business do not implicate one of the coal prosecution priorities, uh, then they file a uh, marijuana limited suspicious activity report. It's a pretty low profile uh, event. It basically is just accounting for the fact that uh, the, the activity that's occurring is, is you know, de facto illegal at the federal level, uh, but it is a really limited priority because it is compliant in compliance with the uh, coal memo and and not implicating one of the pro, you know, one of the priorities that was identified in the Cole memo. Mm -hmm. If in fact uh, the inverse is true, if they if the bank or the credit union believes that uh, the activity that's being engaged in does violate one of the uh, priorities within or implicate one of the priorities within the Cole memorandum, then um, they're required to file you know this priority SAR, uh, SARS that would uh, indicate uh, why um, they believe it is uh, uh, in violation of the Cole memo. What uh, prosecutorial priority is being implicated uh, and describe that in detail. And then if a federal um, uh, or state chartered bank terminates their uh, relationship with a business uh, within the industry, uh, they'd also have to file a suspicious activity report, um, marijuana termination that lays out um, the reason for the termination. Uh, and of course, really what you're driving at here is did the bank or the credit union end the relationship uh, because they had concerns about uh, the company's um, ability to meet, uh, you know, meet um, the the, uh, the priorities set out in the Cole Memorandum, or they weren't able to track uh, where the money was coming from, or they were worried they're involved in some broader criminal enterprise. So it's not a situation where you're you're leaving the bank for another bank. Um, it's really the bank has terminated the re relationship for some reason uh, that might be um, a, a regulatory. Um, uh, reason that that the federal government, uh, the the FinCEN would want to know about, and or potentially other uh, financial institutions would want to know about as well. If that organization uh, goes to uh, another uh, another financial institution, so you know there is a, a road here. You know it's it's not um, it's not uh, without its challenges. It's not without its uh, costs as well. I mean, basically every time there is a transaction within. Uh, a bank or a credit union, a suspicious activity report needs to be filed. Um, that can, uh, that doesn't need to be a labor intensive process. Uh, you know, again, Rob Miller can explain that in more detail, um, but it is a um, activity that has to occur, you know, every time per the guidance. And uh, that can be uh, in the aggregate somewhat labor intensive and, and certainly doing the due diligence uh, that goes into making these affirmative statements that um, that the transactions, the activity is not uh, uh, implicating one of the coal memorandum priorities is also uh, not a, uh, uh, you know, not an, uh, an, not a, uh, uh, it, it is labor intensive. I mean, it, it really is to make sure that that um, is the case and that you can stand behind that as a financial institution. So that's where our department will work with um, with entities trying to develop that internal compliance structure that will allow them to uh, um, meet uh, the FinCEN guidance, allow them uh, to meet and avoid any of the priorities that are underlined under the Cole Memorandum. We've been working with the Vermont State Employees Credit Union for some time uh, in this space. We've worked certainly with any other organization that is um, state chartered that's interested um, in uh, entering the space as well. Um, and uh, we try to do that in a, a way that allows them to be successful in the space. Um, you know, ultimately for the industry, what are the what are the solutions for this? What are the solutions to bring more people into um, more banks and credit unions into the space to allow for a diversity of 
of uh, options when it comes to financial services. You know, either removing, uh, you know, marijuana as a Schedule One drug um, or uh, passing some sort of safe harbor, the Secure and Fair Enforcement, the Safe Banking Act, uh, would have uh, provided a safe harbor for financial institutions to provide uh, financial services to those um, in in the industry. So either one of those, uh, you know, certainly would allow, um, you know, uh, banks and credit unions to no longer worry about those risks that might be slight, but would be, you know, something that would potentially, uh, you know, uh, end the bank or the credit union, uh, causing them to merge with another organization. You know, the fact that those risks are out there, that they're not zero, uh, does make a, um, a board of directors of a bank or credit union really weigh that risk reward calculus. Um, if there is a determination that they can, um, you know, they can in fact move forward uh, they can meet all of those compliance objectives and they can uh, do it in a way that uh, won't unduly uh, put the organization at risk. Uh, then again, that's a decision that that in individual um, banks and credit unions have to make. And and when they make that decision and move forward, then our department is there uh, to help them uh, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring the appropriate level of compliance so that they don't run afoul of the FinCEN guidance or uh, the Cole memorandum. So that's a commitment that we've had for, for many years and, and one that we'll continue to have um, and work with, uh, work with those within our industry. You know, th there's some other approaches that, that states have considered and, and I don't, you know, happy to talk about these as well, but, um, you know, California did a study about uh, the feasibility of a, of a state bank devoted specifically uh, to the cannabis industry. Um, Nevada has talked about sort of tokenizing um, and almost like a cryptocurrency, creating a a payment system that is outside of the traditional payment system. And and I think at this point, um, you know, there's a there, there's a whole host of of complications that have been pointed out both in the California study and and I think you know Nevada, I believe, was piloting this right before the pandemic. I'm not sure actually where they stand today, um, but. You know, I think at the end of the day, um, some of the issues that both a, a state bank or some sort of cryptocurrency would have is that eventually uh, it needs to um, meet back up with the broader, uh, you know, financial apparatus that we have here in the United States. It has to meet back up with uh, the Federal Reserve. It has to be able to bring uh, the cryptocurrency into, you know, into U.S. dollars, into other currency. And and um, they'll have a really difficult time um, establishing a rela relationship with the Federal Reserve uh, if that uh, is their primary or sole uh, focus. So there really hasn't been a, a silver bullet or a great fix other than to say, you know, when a um, organization is ready, willing, uh, and, uh, and conceivably able to move forward with uh, banking uh, those in the cannabis industry, uh, then uh, our department uh, is there to to help them and guide them uh, in developing a compliance program that will work for them uh, and that uh, will again make sure that they are in compliance with the uh, with uh, even our state regulations, obviously, but state and federal uh, regulations. So that's sort of where we, where we stand now, and you can sort of I hope get a flavor of why uh, why. Um, there has been a limited movement, um, not just in Vermont, but across the country in terms of banks and credit unions moving into this space. Ultimately, uh, those first two action items there, I think, would cause a lot more uh, organizations to come and uh, be willing to do banking services. And um, absent that, uh, we certainly need regulators to be in this space, providing guidance and assistance um, at every turn so that, uh, so that uh, organizations that decide to do this can do it successfully. So... Um, Mr. Chair, maybe I'll I'll stop there, and if there are any questions, I'll turn I'll stop sharing my screen. If there are any questions, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank thank you so much, Commissioner Pichek, for that. Um, I know uh, you know you and I spoke. You have kind of a hard stop in a, in a few minutes. You're in the middle of a different meeting right now. Um, uh, if there are questions from the board that couldn't be answered by VSCCU or, or would be maybe better directed towards VCU. VSCCU, I would encourage you to save them. But if there's any for Commissioner Pichek, um, you know he's got maybe a minute. I got a question, but it's and I do, I do, have, I do, I do have a few more minutes, uh, Mr. Chair. I did the the last meeting I was in ran late, so we're not getting back together till uh, one one ten or so, one fifteen. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna 
assume that there's no dumb question. Um, <laughs> oh, no, for sure not. Because <laughs> it seems like a dumb question in my head. Um, one of the recommendations in the tax and regulate subcommittee of the Governor Scott's Marijuana Advisory Commission report was to require licensees to have a deposit uh, a deposit account in, in a bank. We're going to have to make that decision before we're really going to know, you know, the credit union's appetite for this to take on this kind of risk. So if we had that as a requirement and then no credit unions, no financial institutions wanted to get involved in this industry, what is that, where does that leave, you know, the people that are seeking licenses? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, um, you know, right now, um, you know, as you know, the, the Vermont State Employees Credit Union has been has been public about the fact that they've made the that risk analysis and have moved forward um, in banking uh, cannabis related uh, businesses and and maybe um, you know maybe we've had conversations with one other you know organization that maybe has some interest as well but hasn't moved forward and it's a little bit chicken in the egg because you know there's only really you know a handful of possible clients at this moment for those institutions. Um, so they might have interest, but, um, you don't really know how real that interest is until there's more clients and there's more industry, and then you can see that materialize or not. Um, so to answer your question directly, you know, if you required a deposit account and, uh, there were no, or no organizations that were willing to do it, then, um, it would really put them in a, in a tight spot because they wouldn't be able to get, you know, they'd have a, it'd be impossible for them to get financial services. Um, what I would suggest, um, you know, as a as a solution to that, or as a, a way to address that, um, is uh, you know in this process to having uh, to having uh, you know a, a pretty open dialogue with um, not just the Vermont State Employees Credit Union, but with the banking industry and the credit union industry broadly, to get a real sense of of what organizations, what entities might be willing to come into the space once it opens up more broadly for for tax and, and regulate. And we'd be happy to um, facilitate those conversations and discussions. And a lot of their questions might be around compliance and uh, and uh, our, and our department's role in that. So we'd be you know, ready, willing, and able to be at the table to help provide some assurance to them. And then, you know, another another thought I have is, um, you know, if you start uh, if you start slow and steady in terms of the in terms of the um, the number of industry participants. So if, if you if all of a sudden there are 25 um, entities trying to find a deposit account, you know, maybe, maybe that can be handled within um, within even the Vermont State Employees Credit Union, but within the organizations that would be interested in providing banking services. But if all of a sudden there are 250 organizations across the state all at once trying to find those kind of services, it, it might be a real challenge to do that. It would overwhelm, uh, uh, you know, it would overwhelm, um, the demand would overwhelm what was available um, in the Vermont marketplace at the moment. So I think those are the two um, considerations I would think about to try to solve for that is um, how can you, how can you, you know, start, how can you have a slow and steady approach so that it builds up over time? And making sure that um, you get a sense of the of the real interest from the financial service uh, entities, um, you know, leading up to uh, leading up to any decision that you make. Yep. Thank thank you for that, and thanks for the invitation or offer to help facilitate those conversations. I think we should start having those sooner rather than later. Um, any questions? Yeah, Commissioner. Agreed. I can hold my question for you guys. I have one question about cryptocurrency and how it fits into the regulations and the regulated system that you were talking about in your first two slides. I think there's a number of <laughs> yeah, businesses a or doesn't fit into that. <laughs> um, I think that there's a number of cannabis businesses in other states that have used that to sort of get around this. I'm not sure how well that's working for them. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I, I was kind of smiling and laughing because, you know, there, there are some ways in which it, it cryptocurrency fits into that structure. And then there's other ways where it's just really much more outside of that structure. Um, the way it fits in um, most um, directly is that um, entities that that buy and sell and exchange cryptocurrencies, so Coinbase or other organizations um, like that, they have to be registered as a, as a money transmitter, or it could be some other type of licensee um, in Vermont or elsewhere. Uh, but generally, it's a license that they 
get from a state regulator like the Department of Financial Regulation. So for example, um, we regulate those um, cryptocurrency exchanges here in, in Vermont. We don't regulate the cryptocurrency themselves necessarily, uh, but we do regulate the exchanges and they have to um, you know, meet certain due diligence standards and, and the like uh, as a result of that and, and knowing who their customers are and and uh, and that kind of uh, that kind of uh, work, so they they are um, regulated to a degree, but there's um, not the same sort of robust regulatory framework that that fits in around them, and I think the challenges that um, they face, and it, it's de- it's somewhat detailed in that California banking study, is that eventually, as you try to move from cryptocurrency to a fiat currency, and um, and the source of funds is unknown, or the or source of funds is, you know, is federal is still some activity that's federally um, illegal. There are going to be challenges with that, and and if you only keep your assets within that cryptocurrency, there are challenges around you know what functionality you can get out of using that cryptocurrency. So I think, you know, I think it's a it's a good possible workaround in some ways, but eventually, as you try to reconnect with the um, the banking system that works uh, with fiat currency, it becomes a challenge. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll let you get back to your day job. Um, But thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, this is an incredible level setting for us and kind of a, again, a a little bit of a wake up call on, on where things are federally and what the impacts in Vermont are. Yeah, I mean, again, that that's the uh, the ultimate solution. We've been, you know, through our trade or uh, through our membership associations, our national membership associations, we've been encouraged and uh, advocated for the Safe Harbor Act to provide some clarity in the space. We'll continue to do so. We think that's one of the best approaches. But um, whatever we can do to be a resource or supportive to the to the board, um, you know, we are we are there and and are ready to be supportive. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll yeah, be in thank touch. you, everybody. Sounds good. Well, um, uh, we're going to move on. Um, our next witnesses are here in person. Um, we have Rob Miller, the CEO of VSCCU, and Greg Hausman. Heisman. Heisman. And, um, you know, you, you all have been banking with our dispensaries. You have kind of a long history with them. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of some of the challenges that you face there and, um, you know, maybe just following up on some of the points, uh, the finer points of what um, the commissioner mentioned around banking and compliance um, and what it means for VSCC. Sure. Bob, struck by the commissioner's presentation. First of all, thank you for having us. Um, I'm struck by the commissioner's discussion and you know you must be thinking to yourselves other than that this is easy right (laughs) (laughs) or why would anyone want to do this so uh, I'll do my best to answer that and uh, Greg runs our business lending and and services he's also um, his group is the group that leads many of our efforts in in, uh, our cannabis related businesses uh, marketplace so um, he's here to keep me honest and answer questions I'm unable to answer and, and provide you with further insight as well but I'll I'll go ahead and get started and give you some high-level um, insight. Um, you know, let me step back a little bit and just provide you with a little bit of background to kind of level set about the SECU. We are a state-chartered uh, credit union. Uh, the credit union structure is a structure where the credit union is owned by its depositors. Uh, we refer to them as members, not customers, because they actually are owners of the credit union. Um, and we are governed by, we are primarily regulated by the Department of Financial Regulation, but because our share insurance is the NCUA uh, share insurance fund, we are also, we get the benefit of having two regulators. So, um, and it's, that subjects us to the, the variances the, between those two as well. Um, size-wise, we're uh, just over a billion dollars in assets. Uh, we have 70,000 members throughout the state. We have nine branch locations throughout the state. Um, Credit unions are defined by what's called a field of membership. So in order to belong to a credit union, you have to qualify for membership. Historically, that was based typically on your place of employment. It's changed uh, substantially since then to also include places where you live or work or worship or otherwise, um, as well as your family. For VSECU, our field of membership is, it's easiest to think of us as anyone who lives or works in Vermont. Um, as well as if you're a member of other certain uh, associations that may not necessarily be geography-based. 
uh, you can be a member of the SCCU. Uh, our mission is to improve the quality of life uh, for our members. Um, you'll note that it doesn't uh, talk about financial performance or otherwise. We are a tax exempt entity, so we don't have necessarily the same profit motive as for profit uh, organizations. Um, we define quality of life on really three terms. Um, we use environmental, social, and economic well being as our means by which we identify or measure, if you will, quality of life and whether we're being effective against our mission. Um, that makes us, or at least we view ourselves, therefore, as somewhat of an agent of change, if you will, uh, within our communities in Vermont uh, for the benefit of our members. And because our members can be all residents of, of the state of Vermont, plus some, um, we very much view ourselves in the context of change agents within, um, within Vermont uh, more broadly. Um, that's part of the reason, and, and so we, we are a provider of both depository as well as lending services uh, to the current uh, medical marijuana uh, market, as well as other cannabis-related businesses, whether that be hemp cultivators or producers or, or resellers or, or retailers. Um, we do that not necessarily for um, you know, traditional business reasons, uh, for profit or for margin, I guess it would be a better way to think about it from our standpoint, uh, because there just aren't that many <laughs> um, for it to really be all that relevant. And even if that were the case, I'm not sure that that would be our primary motivation. Our primary motivation was one of financial inclusion. We believe that everyone in Vermont should have access to basic financial services at a minimum. Um, and if we can do that in a reasonable and responsible way without putting the rest of our members at risk, then we're going to do that. Um, and we have the same view of other areas of, of our society as well. Um, we're just talking about this particular one today. But that's why we're in the business, and we will always work to try to stay in the business. Um, and I know that sounds weird, um, but given the risk and, and, and cost and compliance that you heard from Commissioner Pichak, it probably puts it a little bit more in context. Um, you know, I, I won't, I'll, I'll roughly go through some of the same risk. I mean, I, I, I don't want to duplicate um, what you've already heard from Pichuk. I mean, I think the risk that I will also talk about, which may be implicit in the commissioner's comments, is um, being in this business subjects us to just a greater level of scrutiny and oversight. Um, that is, in and of itself, a cost, um, you know, in terms of working through that. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that the landscape is one that is constantly changing. And so I liken it, if I can use the probably improper um, sports analogy, it's like the, the field go goals tend to move quite often. Um, and that's not to assign blame on anyone. Everyone's kind of going through it at the same time. And so as we learn and as we experience more uh, of in this business, both from a regulatory perspective as well as from a financial uh, services perspective, things change. They may not change dramatically, but they change enough to sort of uh, influence how we how we do what we do. And we've experienced that um, in the past uh, with regard to the, to the oversight that we're subject to and, and have had to make some fairly dramatic changes um, in the time that we've been involved uh, in this business and it's had an impact uh, on the businesses that we serve. Um, you know, it is a Schedule One drug. Um, you know, it, therefore, it is viewed as a high-risk activity by the regulators. And as a high-risk activity, it's subject to enhanced regulatory uh, oversight. The worst case risk that the commissioner laid out are, I think, all of them is verbatim. <laughs> the worst case risk that, that I was prepared to lay out for you, so I won't uh, get into those. Let me talk a little bit about um, the cost of being in the business, um, both from our standpoint, but also from our members' standpoint over business standpoint. Um, the commissioner mentioned, and it's accurate, there is an excess compliance cost. Um, we have to dedicate specific resources to uh, conduct the due diligence, to conduct the daily monitoring of accounts, um, the filing of, of the SARS that you, that you heard about, as well as the currency transaction reports, because it does tend to be a more cash-based business. Um, you know, we also report quarterly to our board on this business, so the board is more engaged in this aspect of our business than, than any other aspect, any other business line that we're involved in. We also have to engage third-party vendors uh, to provide us some of the services that we require in order to do the daily monitoring. Uh, 
um, those services cost money, of course, as well as additional compliance activity on our part because we have to conduct uh, vendor due diligence on those uh, on those vendors as well. So it, it has a, a bit of a compound effect. Uh, we engage in education and training. The landscape's changing. We got to stay on top of it, um, and we got to continue to build our skills and knowledge. Um, there are the potential legal expenses um, if we were um, sued or prosecuted uh, to defend ourselves. Um, there are potential operational expenses. We're not currently at a scale that necessarily requires that, but certainly an expanded market more than likely would lead us down those paths, whether it's armored car services or, or, or the like, if you will. Um, and then there's the, I wouldn't, they're ill-defined in terms of how you measure them, but there's the potential costs associated with reputation, legal, compliance, oversight. For our members, um, we charge them what I think well, I don't know that I would put words in their mouth, but if I were them, um, I think I would think that there were pretty high fees on their deposits. Um, we base those fees on the maturity and size of the market, um, and we benchmark them somewhat to what we see, or at least what we understand to be the fees of other marketplaces. Ours are basically right in the middle. As the market grows and becomes more mature, and by mature I mean more participants, more financial institution participants in the market, um, as well as, as more dispensaries and cultivators and growers and so forth, um, then I think it would be um, reasonable to assume that those fees will come down as the nature of the competition goes up and the market becomes a little bit more attractive from a scale standpoint. Um, they will more likely pay higher loan rates. As you heard, um, their businesses are subject to federal search and seizure. That makes them unsecured lending. Unsecured lending is the most costly form of lending. Um, even if we have equipment or we have facilities, we can't count 100% on that collateral, and uh, banks and credit unions tend to rely on collateral as the primary means to, to pay back loans. So, you know, we may not price them at a pure unsecured uh, loan rate, but more than likely we will price them higher than what we otherwise would because they do involve additional risk. That again is, is difficult to quantify, but we know that, it, that it's there. Um, and we subject uh, the lending to these businesses to an aggregate lending limit. So there's a limit, even though it's not a cost per se, there's a limit on, on, the capa on our capacity in terms of what we can we lend. So I, you know, the million dollar question, of course, that, that I tend to get asked all the time is, um, will, will you be there for our businesses? <laughs> um, so let me give you, how we're looking at it today, because I don't have a I don't have a solid answer for you in terms of number of, of businesses, um, or, or certainly not an unqualified uh, response to that. Um, we're in that process today uh, of developing ultimately a recommendation that will go to our board and need to be approved by our board that will dictate uh, to what extent we will expand our current um, our current uh, level of participation in this marketplace. Um, that process involves understanding the legislation, also understanding the, the forthcoming regulations. So there is a little bit of a chicken and egg um, catch here. Um, it'll also involve informing and educating both our internal management team that, that will ultimately decide what to bring to uh, the board and, and it'll require um, information and education at the board level as well. So there is a, a process that we'll have to go through to get there. Um, but ultimately it'll, it'll take form in a, a set of recommendations to our board. I think that we'll be prepared to deliver that set of recommendations probably no later than the early part of next year or later later in the year this year. In terms of, so let me just preface everything I'm going to say now by I don't really know yet because I don't have <laughs> approval from my board, um, but I'll tell you what, I, what is my sense of what I think we're likely and unlikely uh, to consider. Um, so I think I think it's likely that we will meet the needs of our existing medical marijuana businesses who enter into the recreational market. I think that that is likely. Um, that seems to be a natural sort of continuum that I think that we would probably fo follow down. Um, and I also think that it's likely that we will provide services to um, a yet undefined number of new businesses. So I think we will likely enter this expanded market uh, not just with our existing business members, but with new business members as well. 
Um, the key question becomes how many and how fast. And that's really probably the, those are the two most important variables that we're dealing with. Um, you know, absent the broader objectives, you know, uh, the fewer and slower, <laughs> the more likely that we will be involved. But there's a wide middle ground in between that that I understand that we're all gonna, we're all gonna wrestle with. Um, our approach, regardless, will be probably one that has been our approach all along, which would be measured and deliberate. And so um, we will want to ease into this market over time, not, not go from point A to point Z um, all in one shot. And you know, that, that will lead to, to other, um, I, think, I think that essentially leads to what is possibly the worst case scenario from a banking safety standpoint, which is that we're unable to meet, we're unable to serve all of the licenses that are, are provided. Um, and that's my worry. I'm sure that that's your worry as well. Um, so that's the that's the sort of the piece that we that we would like to work with you on to try to figure yeah. out. Because we don't want to be in that position either. Because uh, that puts us in a position, um, A, where we have certain business uh, businesses in the state of Vermont that don't have access to financial system that's contrary to our purpose as an organization. It also puts us in a position where we have to decide um, who we're going to serve and, and more, more relevantly who, who we're not going to serve. The risks don't really change. Um, they just uh, change in scale. Um, so the, 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 the specific risks will remain the same absent some action by the federal government, um, but they increase in scale, in scale, right? So if we go from whatever it is, number of accounts, let's say to half a dozen accounts to all of a sudden 100 accounts, you know, our risk has gone up exponentially, maybe not at exactly the same proportion, but, but it certainly goes up some, some level exponentially uh, in terms of size. Um, so what would, what can you do to help? Um, you know, I, I think I'm going to state the obvious. The commissioner already stated um, any role or advocacy role you can play in um, the, you know, the ultimate answer would be declassification of marijuana as a Schedule One drug. And that not only reduces the legal and compliance risk, but it also will probably fundamentally change the nature of the compliance cost as well. The State Banking, Banking Act will eliminate, I hesitate to say eliminate, I'm not sure that that's actually the but it will mitigate um, the risk, but the same measures are likely, I think, are likely to remain in place. So the compliance cost and the oversight and the due diligence and all that stuff that we do that, that, that we've explained and the commissioners has explained, I think still stays, stays there in a safe banking act. So I'm not sure, absent the market becoming really attractive from a business standpoint, that that will necessarily lead to a huge number of new so I'm just, I want to manage your expectations on safe banking and banking act. And that by no means, I would love for the safe banking act to be passed into law uh, because it would address a major concern of our board. As you can imagine, as the commissioner sat down and went through those risks uh, for a volunteer board like mine, that's pretty intimidating. Uh, you know, so um, some, something to think about. You know, I, I, I would encourage you to at least think about and engage in dialogue with perhaps other regulatory agencies within the state about what, what, you know, if we were starting over and starting from scratch, how would we actually conduct the oversight um, as a system of this industry? And, uh, you know, you can point to other industries as examples, whether it's alcohol and liquor with the Liquor Control Board, whether it's hemp with the agency of agriculture. We're not really doing that here. Um, we've, we've pushed a lot of those, what I would consider somewhat unusual compliance burdens onto the financial institutions and kind of pulled us into areas that um, we're, not, we're not typically pulled into when I think legitimately um, you can look at those and ask yourself the question, if, if those are functions that actually shouldn't best be performed by an independent state agency. Um, as opposed to a nonprofit or a for-profit bank or credit union, um, I realize it's like changing. It's it's changing the nature of the game in the middle of the game. But if there's a time to at least take a look at that, now would be the time to, to do that, and we'd be more than happy to work with you on that. 
Um, at the minimum, though, I think um, as the state um, develops and, and takes on a uh, tracking system, the seed to sale tracking system that I think will be required, um, creating mutual access so that we're all operating on the same data set will be really important. It also will uh, reduce the duplication of effort that could occur between ourselves, the control board, or other the tax department, other entities. Um, so creating that common access will be, I think, really, really key and important. And it'll, it'll actually help us streamline our processes at the same time. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to say the same thing that the commissioner said is an option, um, which is I would encourage you to take a measured and, and deliberate approach um, and not look to try to issue all the licenses all at once, but to do that over time um, so that we can do our best to stay in the market. Um, if we do it all at once, um, and I understand the pressures uh, to do that, it's, it's just, it's, I think it's reasonable to expect that we're not gonna be able to meet the entire needs of the industry from day one. Um, and then finally, what you're doing today and, and what I hope you'll continue to do, which is just keep an open line of communication. Um, you know, we're easy, right? We're right down the, we're right down the road. Um, and we're based here in Vermont, we're a state regulated entity. Uh, we have a commitment to the state, not just in terms of our location, but in terms of our actual purpose for being. Um, so we are going to be willing and able partners yeah. uh, in that conversation. So before I answer any questions, did I leave anything out or anything you want to no. correct me? No, on? I thought that was perfect. <laughs> I just, just one, one sidebar as far as you know, keeping the throttle back. Um, if we put, or if, if if it happens too quickly, and businesses that have the legal right to, to a license or, or given a license um, don't have a financial institution option right. that's going to push them to the cash side and it's going to be even harder to for the state and for the financial institutions that the track was going to track yeah. Yeah. it does represent a risk for the state not just the public safety risk but also a risk to actually understand what's going on in those businesses mm -hmm. and that includes paying taxes and cash as yes. well mm -hmm. yeah. which is kind of important I right. understand <laughs> um, are you right if we turn to some questions? Absolutely. Um, I guess a question, well, I have a, a bigger question. First question, though, I, I know we have a lot of folks listening on the phone. I know that your organization hasn't made a determination in certain terms how you're going to move into this new market. I think you said it, at least right now you have a clearer picture in your mind from the, the five dispensaries that are already doing business with you, when would be an appropriate time for folks that are interested in this um, adult use tax and regulate market to, to contact the, the SECU? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I'll defer to Greg formally, but I think that um, they can contact us today. Okay. Um, at least we'll have, you know, a list, if you will, um, of interested parties that, that we can follow up on and, and share, at least share our contact information. Also allows us to communicate with those interested parties sure. uh, when that becomes appropriate. Great. My other question, and, and I realize it may be a challenge to answer, hopefully you haven't found yourself in the scenario that I'm going to put before you, but I appreciate you two in, indulging me. Um, so from this SAR perspective, a marijuana termination SAR, more specifically, I would imagine if an organization, your organization, any organization has to file that, FinCEN does some type of analysis or investigation into what's going on. I'm wondering about liability on your end there versus liability on the business there and how liability on your end, maybe you didn't, maybe a organization didn't detect, you know, um, suspicious activity quickly enough. Mm. We heard about the worst case scenarios, but what other penalties, for lack of a better term, would FinCEN put on an organization that might change your risk assessment for, for being a part of this industry more broadly, I guess, to boil it down, does one bad apple kind of spoil the whole thing? Because if there's only one organization that's really out in front of being a part of this right now, I'd, I'd hate, obviously, I think we all would, that um, one bad situation kind of ruins this security for the whole industry. Yeah. Yeah. When you reach the, you know, when we reach the SAR termination point, that's where you've identified someone that is. You know, Adversely against or, 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 or counter to the coal menu and coal memo and, and the FinCEN. So, usually that reaches a point where the financial institution has realized that these folks are not abiding by the, the law, if you will, 
um, and we've decided to terminate that relationship. So that is, you know, basically letting the, the feds know at that point that you're terminating that relationship. So in, in, in some manner, it does take a livelihood off a little bit because you're already actively closing that membership and getting the termination. Um, one step back, you, you, well, then you've got the, the, the ongoing limb to SAR, and then you've got the, the SAR that's priority. The SAR priority, once you send that in, it may continue to spark more interest from the feds. Um, you know, it's good and bad. It's showing that you're doing your due diligence, that you're catching stuff that's requiring SARS, um, but it is highlighting to the feds that, that there is some sort of issue that is not against, that is against the feds more for a cold memo. Yeah, let me let me bring it up a couple levels though, because I think I think what you're getting at is I'm going to call it the psychological effect of uh, you know a bumpy road, so to speak, right? You 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 come up against a a difficult situation that may or may not be problematic, but but it, you know you got to work through it, if you will. And and you know we have closed accounts before, um, and so we've been. Not exactly in the situation you described, but but in a situation where we are uncomfortable continuing to service those accounts. Um, and the answer to your question is, it absolutely causes you to reassess. Um, no question about it, uh, because you have to ask yourself the question: Is are you know, and, and go back and reassess. You know, are we acting in a responsible way for our member owners? Um, you know, now we have a real life example of a situation that that the risk got to be more elevated than we were comfortable with. Is that a trend or is that an exception? Right. Um, in which case, you know, based on your answer to that, you'll, uh, you know, you'll decide how to move forward. We obviously decided to move forward by continuing to stay into the market. And, and we have a, that's our base case, is mm -hmm. to do everything we can to stay in the market. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that we may not ever get to a point where um, our board says, you know, it's just too much. No, I, I appreciate it. I understand that an exception is an exception, but too many exceptions can change internal calculus. Sure. Yeah. And the nature of those can vary dramatically. Right. So. Thank you. You're welcome. How are um, ancillary businesses affected? If they bank with you or anyone else and they choose to contract with you know, a cannabis establishment? Yep. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how we handle this? Yeah. Um, we've grouped all of our cannabis businesses into one policy and we've come up with a tier system to break those down so depending on how close they are to touching actually THC cannabis they're the highest tier and from there so we have two three tiers basically um, and the third being more just the hemp and, and farmers and the two being all the producers and beside one thing that we need to determine and goes back to the, the trickiness of the regulations is to what percent of a business's revenue does it hit where we should count it as moving up a tier, or not in a tier. Um, you know, if you're a pizza delivery guy and you do you know, one, one lunch a week, and it's 2% of, of your weekly bill. Um, but if you're a major supplier, and 50% of your revenue comes from sale of federally illegal cannabis, where does that put them in the, in, in the term? So I know the SAFE Act, I believe, is the SAFE Act, or one of the other acts that's currently, there are more outlined as to what those kind of relations are, which will help, but right now, we're still unknown. Um, so it's something we have to struggle with. We're looking at it right now as we figure out what we want to do for the coming future. So if I were a, a label printing company in Burlington and I wanted to print labels for a cannabis company, how much of my income, like if I switched 100% to cannabis labeling, that would matter. But if it was just 10% of my business. Correct. Well, but if it was all CBD, you know, if it was all hemp stuff, then it wouldn't have matter at all yeah. because it's federally, you know, it's really fine. Okay. Um, but if you're doing... 100% of your labels for just one of the dispensaries, and that's, that's something we have to look at as an ancillary business. Yeah, you can think of our tiers as risk tiers, right? Yeah. And the more your business is focused on on the Schedule One marijuana activity, um, you're more likely to fall into that first tier. Whether you're a dispensary or not, if you're deriving, you know, it's fair to say, at least a majority, probably less than that. And again, we haven't formulated that exact policy yet, but it's somewhere in between 10 and 100. I know okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. When we're talking about banking services for these tier one organizations, um, are we talking about uh, banking and lending? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah Banking right. is uh, lending's got more capacity constraints to it than than yeah. banking, but they're I wouldn't say either one of them are unlimited yeah. in capacity. You know, with our current tier ones, we have a hundred percent of their deposit business. Uh, and we've done a small piece of lending to them. It's a very small piece of our overall portfolio. And our limits on there is, is very small you know, compared to our, our overall size. Um, and so you know, the, the most of our business is just the drawing the transaction yeah. side. We also have limits uh, on, uh, I believe it's just tier one. It may be all tiers. I think it's just- For lending? For deposits, as a percentage of the deposits, correct? Uh, well, that's on the fee based on the tier one. It's, it's, you know, these are based on the deposit activity. Could you talk just a little bit about the evolution of this relationship? Because um, I remember it starting out largely cash, and now I think it's mostly debit card. Is, it, is, that, is that right? It's, it's still a lot of cash and it's some debit card. Um, there are one of the things that we need to figure out, and what the industry needs to figure out in whole, is what payment systems should we allow? Which ones should we eliminate? Um, there are pros and cons uh, to many of them. Uh, I just went to a cannabis conference uh, last last month, and there's a whole half day just on different payment systems and, and different options. So the industry is talking about a couple of different yeah. options, um, but that's really a puzzle of fit because some things right now are completely off the board. You know, Visa cards can't do a credit card. My payroll folks won't do anything for them. My merchant services won't do anything for them. So there are lots of pieces that we can't do, and then it's a, a, a big enough to fix on the bigger side. If you're just a restaurant, you've got a million options. Um, yeah. That does create cascading fees for the businesses, yeah. which will become a lot more relevant for the small businesses. That I think some of the intent of, of the legislation is without, I, I don't know how public any of these decisions are, or your board meetings, probably not, um, but can you talk a little bit about, at least broadly, about the decision to, to get into the dispensary banking, you know, what, what that was like, was it 2013, 2015? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the issue came up at my very first board meeting. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told Greg on the drive over, uh, it seems like this and one other piece of uh, our business I seem to be somewhat expert in. <laughs> so I'm not sure how that happened. But um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't remember the exact month, but it was uh, at some, I think it was near the end of 2014. And, and we started with one, right? So we started slow. Um, and I think we actually, um, if I remember correctly, we started with one dispensary. We actually didn't expand it from there until we had actually been through an examination cycle. Uh, we literally took our policy and our folders, our due diligence, we had we volunteered, we never do this, right? We volunteered them to the examiners when they came in and said, look at this, yeah. um, because we wanted to know um, how, the, how that would be viewed and, and over, you know, we wanted feedback on our, on our policies. Um, and then as we went through, got through, you know, our first examination cycles, then we gradually added uh, additional clients. Um, you know, as I said, we've, uh, it hasn't been 100% smooth sailing by any stretch of the imagination, um, but that said, um, you know, I will reaffirm that um, that the department has been reasonable to work with. Um, we also have to deal with the NCUA. Um, we don't have necessarily the same connection with them that we do with, with the Vermont department uh, because it's a national group versus a state uh, regulatory agency. But, um, but I would also say that our um, region of the NCUA has also worked with us in a reasonable manner. Um, I'm told by some of my colleagues in other parts of the country that the, the NCOA isn't entirely consistent in how it looks at or, or oversees uh, this business from region to region, but I can say from our experience that the NCOA has been, has been reasonable. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they all, that everyone always does what we want them to do, but, uh, but reasonableness is certainly some, a way I would describe it. This question that I have for you might be crossing a line. If it is, please, you know, you'll be better equipped to let me know, but um, you know, of course, all of the dispensaries have now sold to multi-state or international companies. How involved were you in that decision? I mean, did you, obviously, Call Memo is the backstop for a lot of yeah. the decision making, and, and there's some prescripts in there about ownership. I'm just curious. Um, yeah. 
whether you were involved or uh, or you just kind of had some documents you needed in we, order to check the boxes? No, I, we had some conversations. We knew stuff was going on in the works, um, but it was pretty much out of our control. I think out of the state's control, really. Um, as long as the you know the back due diligence was was done, um, you know, we'll have once the transaction is complete, there'll be other beneficial parties that we'll now have to look at. Um, but we really didn't have a, a, a gate at the front to prevent it. Um, you know, we had a good conversation, so we had an open conversation with our with our folks. Um, but it was pretty much their business decision. Yep. And then I've got a related question to that. This one's much more general, which is um, we as a board have been directed to be somewhat more permissive when it comes to criminal history records about how we're supposed to evaluate them um, for potential license holders. But you all, if you're going to bank and you have to, you know, abide by the Cole memo and kind of this provision in there about, you know, making sure that there's no kind of criminal enterprise, or, you know, I don't know how much that shades or provides guidance to, to you when you think about banking with a potential license holder. Yeah. Um, so I think at, at a high level, um, we have essentially a, a consistent um, mission, right? We want to make sure that we're inclusive of particularly uh, groups that have been and populations that have been historically um, uh, disfavored as a result of the legalization of marijuana um, as an example of, of groups that we want to be inclusive. And so we will work to try to find ways to also, um, I wouldn't say be, you know, to, to be more permissible, if you will. Um, but that said, we're not, you know, there are lines that we can't cross and, and we'll certainly um, look to those lines as, be very clear about those, but I don't know if you have anything for anything for that. Today. Yeah, I mean, I think if it's the, the it's a lot of it is, is the degree of the severity of the offense. I mean, I think there's a long, wide, long, wide range of, of what could be a record and what would be problematic from a financial institution's viewpoint, and what's you know knowing what the history is of yeah. in that you know in that sphere that maybe more understandable, if you will. So it's a case-by-case case evaluation essentially yeah. I think we'll be a little bit more formal than that okay. as we as we get a little bit more okay. as we get a little bit further along in our process right. um, but certainly it's subject to case-by-case case analysis because you can't anticipate right. all the cases uh, up front the policy but but we will dedicate policy time to that in, you know, in our process okay yeah we should continue to talk about that I mean if we're going to require banking if we're, or some sort of cash management policy then might want to have some consistency you know we don't want to set people up for failure go through our process only to find that they are not there to do yours yeah. yeah makes sense um that's those are all my i mean those are all my questions for now. today <laughs> and, uh, you have our email <laughs> yeah exactly i i really do appreciate you being here i do i am going to take commissioner p check up on kind of having an early conversation with all of the credit unions uh, trying to see if we can kind of find chart a path forward yeah. um, and give you kind of open up our playbook to you I mean, I mean we do a lot of our work out in the open we, yeah. we have to and so um, you know as much as we can involve you to make sure that you're giving us the guidance and the input that we need to, to get this right to get to kind of alleviate or mitigate whatever risk we can or develop a system that actually works for you that cuts down on the compliance costs on your end um, yeah. that's that's the only path forward here. So, yeah. Yeah. Please put us going forward. Yeah. We'd love to talk more. We'll do. Yeah. And Thank likewise, we'll reach out to you and, and totally support that effort uh, yeah. to reach out to the, the banks and credit unions. Yeah. It, you know, this is a collaborative effort. Where this is when yeah. we're all in together here. It, so. It's been my impression of, of you specifically in VSCU. So you, VSCU generally. Sorry, <laughs> <is it>? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's yeah. It, you know, I've seen you walk in the halls of the legislature, getting grilled many times, and uh, you've always been, been there for Vermont, living up to the mission that, that you laid out. I appreciate that. Um, great. Well, thanks for being here. Thank thanks you for having Thank us. you, Derek. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, we have, I think, three minutes but if um, for before our next witness is scheduled, but if he is on, we could, you don't see him on? So why don't we just, um, just Take a quick stretch break, sure. and we'll come back at 1:45. Do you want me to pause the recording? No, that's okay. fine. Okay.
Alexander. Hey, uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm James Pepper. Um, this is uh, Kyle Harris and Julie Hallberg. We are the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, we've been meeting all day today around public safety issues. Um, cool. We haven't we haven't quite turned our focus to actually drafting recommendations. We actually just um, uh, are in the midst of negotiating a contract with VS Strategies, and we're thrilled to be working with um, you know you all. I, I could literally listen to Jordan and Andrew talk all day long. If, if, you know. yeah. <laughs> uh, but to, but today we're doing public safety issues. We we heard uh, about some highway safety trends and, and how to respond to them earlier today. We've uh, in the afternoon we've shifted to safe banking and some of the concerns right. around that. We heard from our um, commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation here in Vermont. We just heard from um, kind of the biggest credit union in the state about their appetite um, to get into this industry and how they would like to kind of what they'd like to see federally in order to kind of mitigate some of the risks. And I thought it'd be very helpful for us as a board um, to round out the day hearing about some of the federal leg legislation that exists um, and maybe um, if we could kind of educate ourselves on that and what it would mean for Vermont as we're on the precipice of entering kind of this adult recreational market um, sure. and, and, and safe banking, you know, how we, how we can bank. Definitely. Um, well, maybe I'll start out with a quick intro too. Um, for it's really nice to meet you guys, and uh, thank you so much for for putting in the work. And I'm really excited for you. I'm sure it seems like a very daunting task, but fortunately, you guys have a lot of uh, you know learn from a lot of the uh, the things that were done well, the things that were maybe done not so well, and and really excited to work with you. And obviously, you know, Jen Flanagan being a a former regulator who was there to help build uh, what they've done in Massachusetts. You know, she's going to be great. So. Uh, my background, I started the firm focusing entirely on cannabis and cannabis issues uh, back in 2010, right after Colorado passed their law. And just it's a medical comprehensive regulatory system that passed. And we had 18 days uh, to get applications in and then up to the local level and then another 30 uh, at the state level. So I know you guys are under pretty tight, tight timelines, but uh, we can definitely, you know, the work can get done. And, and again, we have a lot of uh, a lot of things to, to to help different countries we've worked with, different states. And, you know, my role with the firm has always been on implementation and helping with uh, states, starting with Colorado when the governor uh, appointed me as the first person to his task force uh, for implementation, Governor Hickenlooper, now Senator Hickenlooper. Um, and that was back in 2012, 2013, right after the election. So um, just really excited to be able to work with you guys since then I've been doing you know everything and now i've progressed i do a lot of work at the federal level i just stepped down as chairman of the board of two trade federations in the district of columbia that focus entirely on cannabis so i have quite a bit of uh knowledge and experience with with cannabis banking and ed perlmutter rep congressman perlmutter here in colorado and i have been working on his safe banking bill for seven eight years really proud of the work he's done so know quite a bit about that i actually have a comprehensive memo that's uh that i'll send you guys after but didn't want to distract you too much that kind of goes through the history i'm sure you guys got a lot of this really quick but since you just mentioned highway safety just wanted to let you know that um the united states cannabis council which is the federal trade group that uh that i'm i'm now the emirate emeritus chair i always mispronounce this name i stepped down as chairman <laughs> of the board and i'm i'm now the you know the sort of former chair so i i get to to weigh in and pontificate without having too much responsibility, which is great. Um, but we, when I was there, we set up a partnership with responsibility.org, which if you're familiar with responsibility.org, and I'm happy to talk to your, you know, your public safety folks about it, but it was put together by really by the alcohol industry and by the Distilled Spirits Council. But it's a very well-funded 501c3 that has a board independent of, has some alcohol industry representatives, but has a board that um, you know, focuses on on drunk driving and on on responsible use by adults, responsible, you know, limiting access to teenagers. And we signed a formal partnership with them and the, the council to really uh, take what they've learned with highway safety and the alcohol industry kind of reacted after the fact and be very proactive about it. So really excited about about that partnership and happy to share more information and their resources with you guys, too. That's great. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's a big cool. issue. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And there's some really exciting stuff going on. And, 
you know, some engagement at the federal level too on on when they do that the highway bills and these things. There, there's uh, some innovations coming out, and it's definitely an issue people talk about. But we know it's as important as anything, making sure the streets and the highways are safe. So, anyways, I digress. Uh, but back to banking. So. Uh, I thought I'd do just, I mean, does a general overview help? Again, I've got, you know, really, I can give you the, the general overview where we're at. I just don't yeah. really, yeah. I, I know I know a lot of these bills, the Moore Act and the Schumer bill, uh, do a lot more than just banking. Um, yep. But, uh, you know, our, our focus today mostly is on the banking issue. Cool. Um, yep. So, you know, essentially right now there's, uh, the FinCEN has created a, uh, there was guidance that was given that was actually withdrawn by the Trump administration, but Treasury still has guidance uh, through FinCEN that creates a very pretty pretty detailed structure. I call it a, it's not a safe harbor. I call it a safe inlet for banks and credit unions because it's it's not the full safe harbor you'd want with uh, something that was actual federal legislation. But what we have is a pretty pretty robust uh, compliance toolkit that they've given in terms of how you found it. Again, there'll be a lot more detail in uh, the memo that I send you, um, but it, it gives the banks and credit unions, financial institutions, the ability to, they say, you know, this is how you can work with the industry. This is the types of things you need to do when you're doing reporting on any transactions. And this includes suspicious activity reports. If you guys have heard about those, how you file the different suspicious activity reports, it actually classifies uh, businesses in sort of in different ways. Are you primarily generating all your income from the sale uh, or transfer of cannabis or cannabis products? Um, stepping back from that, are you providing services to the industry and uh, are the services you provided? Is the majority of your income coming from, you know, people who are selling cannabis or cannabis products to other businesses or to consumers? And then you have people that are kind of another layer out that have some business in the cannabis industry, but are not generating the majority of their income. So our law firm, for example, we fall into that second bucket. We, all of our revenues come, or the majority of, vast majority of our revenues come from cannabis businesses or, you know, and then we have other revenues that come from, uh, you know, working with local governments where we've represented some cities and counties, um, working with some, you know, uh, federal governments in other countries. Um, so that would be the thing that's not really implicated because that's all just helping with public policy. But but because we're in that second bucket, we have the same challenges with bank accounts that a lot of our clients do. Uh, maybe not quite as much because we are a law firm and we're, you know, but we do, you know, we've actually, I've actually had the pleasure, not so much pleasure of of losing several bank accounts over the years because we've always been 100% transparent um, since 2010. Um, but, you know, banks sometimes get skittish and their reasoning is everything from we're going to very strictly follow the federal law. And even though there's been some safe, you know, some safe inlets or some uh, some some guidance given about how we could bank with you. We're just not there yet, you know, and so we lost a couple of those banking relationships. We now have several banking relationships across the country um, with banks that know what we're doing, transparently doing it. And they also work with a bunch of clients. So one of the other resources we can provide for you is banks. You know, I know the credit union talked to them about, you know, any compliance issues they might be, you know, really show them what a robust compliance package looks like that can put them in the same sort of status as a lot of banks around the country and credit unions around the country that are doing this and doing it well. Um, again, if they, you know, there's that initial hump, they have to take that, well, we're going to still take a chance because we know it's not 100% protection, right? So the way we get to 100% protection is through the Safe Banking Act or through the MORE Act, as you mentioned, or through the Booker Schumer Wyden package. Now, the Safe Banking Act has passed the House now twice, and uh, it passed back in 2019. Went to the Senate, didn't go anywhere. Senator Crapo from Idaho was working on some things, but really was not. Idaho's, I think, you know, really has very, very, very limited, if any, cannabis activity, um, and and so he's a that's his home state, his constituency. So, you know, even though he we had some good conversations, it didn't move anywhere in the Senate. Now that it's changed to Democratic control, even though it's by, you know, razor thin margin, um, there's definitely more conversations and the, the committee leadership has changed. But really, so in 2021, the, the Safe Banking Act passed again in this Congress, and it actually passed by a margin of 321 to 101, I believe. And that the real cool thing there is that we got both we got it. We have a majority of both Republicans and Democrats. A super majority of Democrats voted for it, and a and a majority of Republicans voted for it. So that was a really important, you know, step forward because it obviously shows 
really strong bipartisan support, at least on the House side. Unfortunately, in the Senate, not unfortunately, but because of the package that Senators Booker, Senator Schumer Booker and Wyden put together, the the banking bill, the state banking bill, as far as the Senate goes, it's in a it's in sort of a a pause point right now while we go through the process of giving comments on on their package. Now those comments are due on September 1st and they released that bill to the masses and said, if you have comments, here's how you can get comments back. Um, they're gonna take those comments and try to reincorporate them into a new draft. Even with their package, there is some concerns about around banking that just, you know, it's not as robust as the safe banking bill. So that will be something that we'll be commenting on as a firm and and the I, I imagine many people in the industry will be commenting on commenting on. One of the primary challenges being what about legacy cash is what we call it. You know, if these businesses that have been operating in all cash, how do they bring cash in the system? There's not as much clarity as we'd like. And, you know, this is part of the issues that some of the folks, American Bankers Association, others have raised about the safe banking package itself is there's just some finer details that could be put into the legislation that would be really helpful. So that, you know, whereas the Booker Schumer Wyden package really focused on a very robust regulatory structure, a lot of really interesting and I think positive things on social equity and diverse, you know, making sure there's diversity reflecting the diversity of the country and the industry. Um, but I, I think on the banking stuff, you know, there's definitely some some nerdy, robust comments that Jordan and Andrew, you know, would pontificate about that we need to get in there. But uh, Cory Booker during that during that uh, press conference actually said, I don't want banking to pass because it's going to be beneficial just to a small number of people, um, as opposed to getting a, the, the whole thing done, which would really address all these policy issues that are really important to me. We had a subsequent conversation, a smaller group of us with him about about some of the things he was talking about um, in light of that, because, look, if we can't get senators, you know, Schumer, Booker and Wyden's bill to to move because we can't get enough Republicans on board. And frankly, there's a couple of Democrats that are still on the fence. You know what we need to we need to think about public safety and we need to think about um, particularly small business, because frankly, 80, you know, in Colorado, 80 to 90 percent of all the businesses have bank accounts. Um, and really around the country, we have a very robust, even though a lot of the messaging out there is that everyone's operating in all cash. It's not that, you know, it's it's expensive. The bank accounts are expensive because of these additional compliance burdens that are put on people. But, um, you know, for the most part, every made, you know, all of the larger companies have many bank accounts and do not have a problem finding those bank accounts. It's when you get to the smaller and smaller companies that are just mom, mom and pops in particular, where we've seen some challenges, but we have found solutions for them too, particularly through credit unions. Um, and so around the country in every state where where there's an, a functioning adult use and really medical program, a few a few notable kind of exceptions where Nevada's had, you know, some challenges with just having a very limited access to banking, uh, banking services in terms of the number of banks that are that are willing to do it, but that's gotten better. But besides that, around the country, you know, there there are a number of banks that are very interested in in servicing this industry have have done so in their home state or actually moved into other states to do it and are are interested in doing it as the market progresses. But I think in in a place like Vermont too, of getting you know talking to the 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 state you know banking commissioners or the, you know the finance people that you guys have referenced and also just just speaking with. Uh, you know the the credit union the any advocacy organizations or lobbying organizations you know there's the there's the american bankers association which we partnered with on this legislation that can bring some you know some some very good information to bear for their for for banks and the credit union association as well um but you know certainly there's opportunities to to talk to any banks local state banks or you know others about you know what a program looks like and i'd be you know we've done this in I've, I've pre presented to the American Bankers Association annual meeting and state meetings around the country, as has we have a, a banking practice. Sahar is our in our L.A. office is really as focused on fintech and banking, um, you know, so we have a roster of banks, too, that are more than happy. They're federally chartered. They're more than happy to work with, uh, you know, some of the, you know, at, with businesses and in emerging markets where we have some time. I think we can also help educate some banks and, and give them some comfort. But at the end of the day, I always tell people this is a decision, you know, you guys are really going to have to make. And a lot of times it comes down to the board and risk tolerance. And, and again, you'll see in the in the in the memo, it talks about not just the the legal risk, but there's, you know, there's reputational risk 
Um, you know, my Wells Fargo bank account won't let me trade Canopy stock, which is a federally legal Canadian company that's not even doing anything other than it's selling cannabis in Canada legally under their federal law. And it's traded on the New York Stock Exchange, but Wells Fargo's taken the position that we don't want any cannabis stuff, you know, and I don't know if it's just sort of a institutional, I I, I, can, I, I chalk it up to what what I call reputational risk, right? They just, they don't want to be seen as banking industries. They're, might, they, they're worried they're going to lose some customers that might think cannabis is a bad thing, you know, or just, you know, so it's simple for these big banks in particular, it's just simple to kind of stay out for now. Um, Wells Fargo even took it a step further. Um, and then there's the increased diligence requirements. That's why we see costs associated with these bank accounts. So a lot of times a bank account for a business, you know, I don't know the last time I paid the monthly checking fees years and years ago, right? Um, but in this industry, the banks that do provide accounts, they charge anywhere from $500 to $1,500 a month because they have to have these, you know, increased reporting requirements, increased due diligence requirements. And frankly, they're taking a risk, so they probably want to make a little money there too. Right. And right now, even with all those banks, very, very, very few of them, if any, are giving loans, which is why safe banking, that's another big part of safe banking. That's, you know, in addition to providing all these protections that banks can't be penalized for banking the industry, they can't be discouraged from regulators, all the stuff that's in the, the safe banking law, um, you know, which I think is is really important. But the big thing too is getting being able to get loans from your community banks to start a small business. You know, right now that is a bridge too far for everyone because it goes from just saying we're taking deposits, helping the regulated system succeed for tax collection purposes and for transparency purposes. But if we start loaning to people, that looks a lot more like aiding and abetting a, an illegal business. So most banks don't do it. Now we have seen some insurance companies that have, you know, that have a lot of assets that are loaning money for real estate to the cannabis industry. But again, it's pretty, it's pretty limited. Um, and, and, you know, what we tell people is, you know, overall, you can transparently bank if you're a cannabis company. And we, we strongly recommend, if not require any client, you know, it used to be you'd have a funny name that sounded nothing like cannabis and you just cross your fingers and hope your bank wouldn't figure out that you're a cannabis business. That was like six, five, six years ago. Now, everyone who's banking is transparently doing so. And to not do that is just, you know, you're setting yourself up for all of a sudden you get a letter saying you got 30 days and your bank account's going to be shut down and that no one wants that, right? Because you have to find a new one. If you get a check from your current bank and you have nowhere to deposit it, it's not really a, a very valuable check. So I'll pause there for a second. Uh, you know, I know I jumped around quite a bit there, but hopefully that helped a little bit. Questions? Um, are you aware of any of the uh, credit unions in, in any recent years? I mean, our, um, uh, we got a rundown of sort of like the highest level risk, like losing your master account with the FDIC. Like, are you aware of any banks that have lived, have been shut down in that way if they're banking with cannabis establishments? Nope, not one. And, and you know, the um, we have, you know, so if you're federally chartered, you have a primary regulator, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, um, which is staffed by, you know, typically it's staffed by Southern senators and or former, sorry, former Southern Senate staff and more conservative people. And it's a more conservative body. Um, the FDIC insurance that everyone needs. We've not seen anyone. We've seen audits. We've seen and we've, we've had auditors even five, six years ago come in and do do deep dives into how they're keeping their records and are they keeping all these SARS reports. You know, and 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 we've had banks get through these audits and these reviews by their regulators. Um, I, I'm trying to think of any. The only time we've ever, I, I know, I remember there was a bank maybe that was very heavily, like all their assets were cannabis assets, and there was just concerns of being a single sort of industry bank that if there's disruption in that industry, it was more of a reserve requirement issue or a, you know, uh, it was a different issue than. We don't like cannabis. It was just more like your your the risk tolerance when you're so heavily involved in one industry creates some regulatory concerns. Now the credit unions have had more flexibility because they've been they you know they have a, a separate regulatory structure and so there's been you know quite a few credit unions that have gotten in and it's been a, a little bit more friendly um, in terms of the the regulators. But I wouldn't call it unfriendly from the other regulators. We're not seeing. You know, people aren't just sitting pins and needles worried about if the regulator finds out they're banking cannabis. They very much know about it. They might have a heightened audit, you know, when they go through their their annual audit or their quarterly audits or whatever it is. But no one's shut down that that we've seen. And the only I think if the only time it would happen is if you saw a bank that was 
involved in or gross negligence involved in nefarious activity, you know. I guess just bouncing bouncing off of that, have you seen banks or credit unions that have entered this space and then, you know, decided that while they're in engaged that it's just not something that they want to take reputational risk anymore, or they've you know not hit the, hit those doomsday scenarios from a um, you know losing access to FDIC, so on and so forth. But uh, like you know a thousand small cuts still equal yeah. that. Yeah, it's a lot of it that I've seen it. It's just been, you know, you've got a due diligence program and the main person decides to, you know, jump ship and go to go in house with, uh, you know, a compliance company or something. And then it, it puts them in a bad spot because they don't have that staff. And so business decision or just, you know, they mispriced it. And so, uh, I, you know, a number of banks, too, have just kind of said, we're only going to take this many customers because we just don't want to, that's the number that we think we can manage and we're not trying to make a huge splash here. Um, so I've seen some limit the number. I'm trying to think of any, I don't think anyone has started doing it and then exited it unless they were doing it with just a few people, right? And it wasn't really known, maybe it was known in a region or a specific bank, but then when kind of the national sort of said, we're gonna have a new policy, they shut, they said, we're not gonna do this anymore, but it was because they, in the absence, it wasn't because they entered the market, and then exited. It was because they were kind of in it with with a few customers, and then they formalized their policies and decided not to do it at this time. Um, we've seen that, but I'm trying to. I'll, I'll check with Sahar too, um, who I think will be a great resource uh, for you guys. But she, you know, she tracks these things. She has our list of 20 to 30 banks, which when people are looking for bank accounts, we can say here's, you know, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. And and again, some of these are federally chartered, and so they can you know enter into new states relatively easily without going through the the state banking system. But a lot of a lot of these banks too are state chartered banks, so it's a, it's really about getting uh, you know the here it was the Department of Regulatory Affairs that we worked with. It's now Congress now Congressman Jonah Goose from Colorado, but he was the head of the Department of Regulatory Affairs before he became the he took over Jared Polis' seat in United States House of Representatives. And he helped us really move the ball forward. And that was about seven, seven, eight years ago. So we, you know, a lot of states have have really addressed these issues. If you have a friendly banking commissioner, and particularly, you know, an attorney general that understands these things, we, you know, you guys were talking about public safety before this. Obviously, this is a huge public safety issue. And so we work the attorney generals really hard on this too. To, you know, it's just public safety. And the irony of not ha not allowing banking is that that, you know, having an all cash business. If I, if the the cops came to me and said, why do you have an all cash business, Christian? I'm like, oh, I just prefer that. You know, that's like a huge red flag, right? <laughs> when you have banks and you can match up all of your receipts and these 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 programs, these compliance programs, you know, you know, it's matching all of your receipts with all of your sales and all of your cash and doing that that balance. And then also doing these suspicious activity reports on everything that, you know, says, you know, this business is, is in compliance. And then when you have certain types of suspicious activity, you, you escalate them to a higher level of those suspicious activity reports. And, you know, we haven't seen many of those, but when they do, then there's action taken, those accounts get shut down and it's become pretty, you know, relatively uh, uh, easy to work with. And there's actually a few service providers out there. One's named Hyper, H-Y-P-U-R, um, that's created a bank compliance, you know, uh, former guys from like Visa and other things that have created some bank compliance stuff. And there's a few others out there like that too that are specifically, you know, will work with, uh, you know, the, uh, the banking industry and the states to, uh, you know, to to really help make sure banks understand what their compliance obligations are and automate a bunch of that reporting stuff. I'm not pitching them by any means. I'm just throwing them out there as one. Tyler there is a good resource for me because I always, you know, he's always telling me when there's new banks coming coming into the system, and that's how we just continue to increase our roster of banks um, for the industry. Christian, um, I hope I'm not misrepresenting what the credit our credit union just said, but I think they said that you know the uh, the Schumer um, Booker um, uh, Wyden bill would both eliminate their risk and it would eliminate their compliance costs that they then pass on to their customers. Um, the Safe Banking Act would eliminate their risk. For the most part, but it would not eliminate their compliance costs. Um, yep. Could you explain where the kind of um, 
or is it the Blumenauer McClintock Lee amendment, um, or even the kind of skinny one that rela relates only to banking would fall on that spectrum? So, you know, really what they're talking about is so the bank, you know, safe banking bill, it, it sort of codified these heightened due diligence, heightened reporting requirements. Um, but it also creates a bunch of safe harbors and actually creates more business opportunity because you can loan to the industry and this industry has, you know, the, the rates you can you could definitely probably charge a premium, hopefully not too much of a premium. So the op that would offset some of these costs. I think that the current Schumer Booker Wyden package, it does, it would do what, what they said, which is really eliminate at least initially some of the compliance costs. But there's a number of industries that have a hard time with banking, not cannabis like typically, typically cat businesses that are a lot of cash are also businesses that are used for money laundering right so you know uh car washes there's like these notorious you know i'm not just using that from breaking bad but they did that <laughs> for a reason and there was a uh, there was a, a thing called operation choke point back in the 2000s which was designed to identify 30 industries that are very in that historically used to uh, money launder and do other things. And so even if the bill passes, that doesn't mean that, you know, because people still are going to use a lot of cash when they go to dispensaries. Maybe they'll use credit cards more, maybe they'll use, but like, you know, if you don't want it to show up on your credit card because you're afraid, you know, it might, you know, it's in the public record that you're a cannabis consumer, um, you know, people tend to use cash. So this will probably remain a cash heavy business just because of that fact going forward, maybe a lot less so if people can use credit cards and ATM cards and 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 whatnot. But it's still gonna be a compliance issue because, you know, if banks, you know, are banking this industry, they're still gonna have to do all of the reporting that is otherwise required of them and in a cash intensive business, which would be slightly less than what we have in FinCEN and safe banking, but it's not gonna be a magic bullet that all of a sudden it's just gonna be like, you know, the the customers are like a a typical you know store that's that's a mainstream current mainstream industry does that make sense yeah, yeah. um you have yeah. any thoughts on uh blumenauer mcclintock yeah just the enforcement you know, you're talking about the the amendment that would be yeah so right now it's it limits the federal government from spending money on enforcing in right. states where uh you know where where there's a legal cannabis program medical or adult use and this, they did, they extend this to banking and, and the, the Justice Department, you know, there is still because of the FinCEN guidance. And, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations around, you know, and, and look, we don't know that that, you know, that that we've never gotten it to extend to recreation or, you know, to adult use cannabis. We're hopeful this year that that we can do that. But, you know, it's. It's not, and and with everything going on with the infrastructure stuff and everything else, a lot of the some of these things have been put to the to the back burner. So I don't see that as as a a, a super viable solution at this point. I think we're going to be under the FinCEN sort of model for the time being. I'm hopeful that you know the the enforcement, uh, you know the taking away enforcement dollars for adult use. I I would love to see that in there, but even with that currently not in there. We haven't seen enforcement except for when people are not following their state laws, even under the Trump administration. And, you know, early Obama, there was some enforcement issues. Uh, later Obama administration, there was very little unless you were doing something totally wrong. Um, this is for businesses and banks and anyone else. And then during the Trump administration, you know, uh, Secretary Mnuchin kept in place the FinCEN guidance, even though uh, the Attorney General Sessions pulled the other guidance that gave people, you know, the coal memo, we call it, uh, which gave us a lot of what we what we felt was a lot of, you know, some protection. But even though that coal memo is gone, having that FinCEN and, and Secretary Mnuchin keeping that in place is a very meaningful distinction, you know, to make sure everyone understands. But even if we don't get the McClintock uh, Blumenauer amendment with with these additional protections for adult use, I don't think the risk profile changes much. It would just be a nice win. To, to kind of keep saying, let's spend our money in the right place, but already those are limited resources inside the federal government. And they, you know, these these programs are typically very intertwined anyways, medical and adult use. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so we also heard from our credit unions that their decision on whether or not to bank and the, is not gonna be until we're well into our rulemaking process and possibly well into our licensing process. 
mm -hmm. uh, at least if we are able to kind of maintain the uh, timelines that are in our enabling legislation. Yeah. So what does that mean for us? Uh, you know, if we essentially have zero banks that are willing to bank in this realm at the outset, uh, well, what does that mean for the marketplace? Well, to one answer to that question would be, I think that there are other banks that would be more than happy to to service Vermont um, and businesses in Vermont, um, even though, you know, the the program might be smaller in comparison to some states. There's people that just really, um, you know, there's going to be um, there's just an interest in this and some of the banks and credit unions that are doing this, you know, they really enjoy this as a business and they like the entrepreneurial nature of it. And so we've seen there is a bank in Oklahoma that's now open branches in several different places and are doing a great job um, helping out the industry and doing it at a really competitive price point. Um, so I, I do think that other banks might might look at it or credit unions. But also, I think that, you know, you can't really, uh, you know, until you have a license, and until you're actually engaging in the sale of cannabis, you're not violating federal law. So you could have your your application company. We've had this where bank, you know, we use a, a a more traditional bank account. We say, hey, look, when we do switch over, you know, either we'll leave the will our relationship will end at that point because we'll we will then be engaging in what amounts to you know uh, something that's illegal under federal law. But we've had success with banks saying, yeah, that's fine. You can do it now while you're waiting. But I also think that one of the check boxes that's the most important one is that you're operating legally under state law. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, bank accounts will do the front end work saying, you know, we're assuming that when you get there, you'll be operating with a license and legally under state law. And if you don't, we will terminate our bank. You know, if you don't get your license, you're probably going to close up shop anyways. And, let, you know, I doubt if you're like, well, I'm going to keep selling, I'm going to sell marijuana anyways without a license, they'd probably that'd be a good time to shut the bank account down. So that that won't happen. But I do think that we could work with the credit union too to to see if we can help them answer these things and, you know, have it seg you know, uh, planned out in a way that would not be um, detrimental to businesses that are trying to start up. The big issue is always legacy cash. If there's any caregiving in, you know, in Colorado, we had these caregivers that were transitioning into this legal market and they really didn't have bank accounts. And so they had all this cash from their previous you know, operations, and they tried to account for it and show in California, this was a huge problem as well. Um, and it's something that's really important in the safe banking. But that's a big part of the discussion around safe banking and any banking discussions that are happening at the federal level is what do we do with legacy cash? Um, and, you know, I don't think it'll be as big of a problem for you guys, but it could be an issue, you know, and also when cash, you know, if there's someone, an in, you know, kind of an investor or someone who's putting in some money, you know, just making sure that that money is vetted and where did it come from if it came from another cannabis program. You know, there's all sorts of of sort of private market solutions that have come up from that in terms of people that are trying to help uh, help when new programs are opening up. But, you know, we've got Georgia. We've got a bunch of new programs that, you know, that, you know, Georgia just announced some new licensing, you know, New York and New Jersey. And I, I just think that, you know, the banking issue when it used to be every single day, it was an hour plus of my day. Now it's maybe an hour a month because we have banks that are that are willing to come in and solutions that are willing to do it. And if you're if you're starting up a business in Vermont and you're saying, look, I'm not doing anything illegal, we certainly have banks that will bank people in the at the front end here while that's happening. And I'll find out if there's any banks. I mean, again, I would love to just support Vermont banks and Vermont credit unions that are willing to do it. It's like you always want to help support local the local economy. So I'd love to help them. And I'd be happy to talk to them individually and, you know, consider us a resource, obviously, too, for anything happening at the federal level. I will keep you guys, you know, we'll keep you 100 percent in the loop on on any advancements or any, you know, scuttlebutt that we're hearing. Um, but in the meantime, too, we're happy to talk to banking institutions or connect them with other banking institutions that have done done this or the the folks at the ABA that have that have supported some of their uh, banks or, the you know, it's the I forget the name of the NCUA is the credit union insurance equivalent to FDIC, but there's also a national trade association for credit unions that have done a lot of good work on this that might be able to provide some resources and comfort to them. But I, look, I appreciate that they're being so thoughtful about it, honestly. Yeah. Some some people are just like, let's do this. And then they're like, oh man, I had no idea that I had to, you know, do all these forms and hire someone. But fortunately, because of, you know, just economic activity, there's been a lot of of solutions that have come about. And these are people that came out of big, you know, financial services industries, big banks and stuff that are just really excited about being a part of um, this this new economy. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us that update and being a resource for us. Um, 
we're thrilled to be working with VS Strategies. Um, thrilled to be working with you. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, our credit unions absolutely want to have that conversation with us and want to make sure that we're all kind of jumping together or, or at least speaking the same language. So I think that Definitely. it's a huge help for us. Yeah, and and I'll send you guys this memo. Just it probably has a lot of stuff that you've heard, but it just has the FinCEN. You know, just it's a shorter, it's a longer version, distilling some of what I said more. You know, just in in a more organized fashion. But I, you know, really appreciate what you guys are doing, and you know, we always, uh, you know, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to to set up any new program or do anything. But um, like I said, fortunately, you guys have. There's a lot of uh, a lot of trial and error that's gone on, but also a lot of successes that have gone on and uh, the way you guys are approaching it and, and primarily focusing on public safety is definitely, you know, an important thing. And, you know, to the extent your attorney general has, has been involved or not, um, Phil Weiser here in Colorado um, is definitely a good resource in the Western attorneys general. Uh, I think it, it's it used to be called Western attorneys general. It's now called the AG Alliance. It was everything West of the, of the Atlantic is what I joke about. It became, pretty much every AG in the country, but they've, they spent, they had their big conference in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago, spent a whole day on cannabis issues related to public safety, including banking. So there's, there's some really good engagement by some attorneys general, which are kind of, you know, very, for the most part, consumer safety and public safety oriented. So that could be a good resource too. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Anytime. Yeah. It's great to see you guys. Hopefully I get to meet you sometime soon. And uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing. It's really, it's really uh, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Right. You too. Um, so last agenda item is public comment. Um, we will do public comment um, the same way that we have been. Uh, if anyone joined via the link um, and you'd like to make a public comment today, please raise your virtual hand and we'll call you in the order that we see them. Right group today. <laughs> okay, uh, it looks like uh, maybe we have one person that's joined via the phone. If uh, if you had a public comment you'd like to make, um, feel free to unmute yourself. It's star six. Um, Tito. Hey there. Um, so, um, yeah, to, I, I, I actually would like to make a comment um, about something I heard um, last week on, on last week's meeting. Um, it was um, one of the processor uh, gentlemen or, or one of the lab gentlemen, and uh, he was he was saying how we really needed to have the big players come in and and really just have the uh, the the local growers kind of um, serve to just add as an accent, you know, and, and fill in the gaps. And, you know, I, I really just want to say that the, the Vermont, Vermont growers can really accomplish a ton. And if they had, uh, if all of us, if we had the same advantages that the dispensaries were getting, um, I think that, uh, I think we, we would all really, really impress uh, everyone. Um, that's it. Thank you. Anyone else uh, would like to make a public comment? Um, please feel free to raise your, your virtual hand. Okay. Um, well, uh, we haven't quite uh, decided uh, about a meeting next week. We might take a week off. Um, as we kind of move into a new phase of our work. Um, but we will, uh, one way or the other, um, update our website and uh, let folks know. And um, with that, I'd take a motion to adjourn. Uh, move to adjourn. Seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right.